Chapter 7 The Interior of the Musketeers When D'Artagnan was out of the Louvre, and consulted his friends upon the use he had best make of his share of the forty pistoles, Athos advised him to order a good repast at the Pomme de Pin, Porthos to engage a lackey, and Aramis to provide himself with a suitable mistress. The repast was carried into effect that very day, and the lackey waited at table. The repast had been ordered by Athos, and the lackey furnished by Porthos. He was a Picard, whom the glorious musketeer had picked up at the bridge Tournelle, making rings and plashing in the water. Porthos pretended that this occupation was proof of a reflective and contemplative organization, and he had brought him away without any other recommendation. The noble carriage of this gentleman, for whom he believed himself to be engaged, had one planchet. That was the name of the Picard. He felt a slight disappointment, however, when he saw that this place was already taken by a compeer named Mousqueton, and when Porthos signified to him that this state of his household, though great, would not support two servants, and that he must enter into the service of D'Artagnan. Nevertheless, when he waited at the dinner given by his master, and saw him take out a handful of gold to pay for it, he believed his fortune made, and returned thanks to heaven for having thrown him into the service of such a Croesus. He preserved this opinion even after the feast, with the remnants of which he repaired his own long abstinence, but when in the evening he made his master's bed, the chimeras of Planchet faded away. The bed was the only one in the apartment, which consisted of an antechamber and a bedroom. Planchet slept in the antechamber, upon a coverlet taken from the bed of D'Artagnan, and which D'Artagnan from that time made shift to do without. Athos, on his part, had a valet whom he had trained in his service in a thoroughly peculiar fashion, and who was named Grimaud. He was very taciturn, this worthy seigneur. Be it understood, we are speaking of Athos. During the five or six years that he had lived in the strictest intimacy with his companions, Porthos and Aramis, they could remember having often seen him smile, but had never heard him laugh. His words were brief and expressive, conveying all that was meant and no more, no embellishments, no embroidery, no arabesques. His conversation, a matter of fact, without a single romance. Although Athos was scarcely thirty years old, and was of great personal beauty and intelligence of mind, no one knew whether he had ever had a mistress. He had never spoken of women. He certainly did not prevent others from speaking of them before him, although it was easy to perceive that this kind of conversation, in which he only mingled by bitter words and misanthropic remarks, was very disagreeable to him. His reserve, his roughness, and his silence made almost an old man of him. He had, then, in order not to disturb his habits, accustomed Grimaud to obey him upon a simple gesture or upon a simple movement of his lips. He never spoke to him, except under the most extraordinary occasions. Sometimes Grimaud, who feared his master as he did fire, while entertaining a strong attachment to his person and a great veneration for his talents, believed he perfectly understood what he wanted, flew to execute the order received, and did precisely the contrary. Athos then shrugged his shoulders, and without putting himself in a passion, thrashed Grimaud. On these days he spoke a little. Porthos, as we have seen, had a character exactly opposite to that of Athos, he not only talked much, but he talked loudly, little caring, we must render him that justice, whether anybody listened to him or not. He talked for the pleasure of talking, and for the pleasure of hearing himself talk. He spoke upon all subjects except the sciences, alleging in this respect the inveterate hatred he had borne to scholars from his childhood. He had not so noble an air as Athos, and the commencement of their intimacy often rendered him unjust toward that gentleman, whom he endeavored to eclipse by his splendid dress. But with his simple musketeer's uniform, and nothing but the manner in which he threw back his head and advanced his foot, Athos instantly took the place which was his due and consigned the ostentatious Porthos 
to the second rank. Porthos consoled himself by filling the antechamber of Monsieur de Troville and the guardroom of the Louvre with the accounts of his love scrapes, after having passed from professional ladies to military ladies, from the lawyer's dame to the baroness, there was question of nothing less with Porthos than a foreign princess, who was enormously fond of him. An old proverb says, Like master, like man. Let us pass, then, from the valet of Athos to the valet of Porthos, from Grimaud to Mousqueton. Mousqueton was a Norman, whose specific name of Boniface his master had changed into the infinitely more sonorous name of Mousqueton. He had entered the service of Porthos upon condition that he should only be clothed and lodged, though in a handsome manner, but he claimed two hours a day to himself, consecrated to an employment which would provide for his other wants. Porthos agreed to the bargain. The thing suited him wonderfully well. He had doublets, cut out of his old clothes, and cast-off cloaks for Mousqueton, and, thanks to a very intelligent tailor, who made his clothes look as good as new by turning them, and whose wife was suspected of wishing to make Porthos descend from his aristocratic habits, Mousqueton made a very good figure when attending on his master. As for Aramis, of whom we believe we have sufficiently explained the character, a character which, like that of his lackey, was called Bazin. Thanks to the hopes which his master entertained of some day entering into orders, he was always clothed in black, as became the servant of a churchman. He was a Berichon, thirty-five or forty years old, mild, peaceable, sleek, employing the leisure his master left him in the perusal of pious works, providing rigorously for two a dinner of few dishes, but excellent. For the rest he was dumb, blind, and deaf, and of unimpeachable fidelity. And now that we are acquainted, superficially at least, with the masters and the valets, let us pass on to the dwellings occupied by each of them. Athos dwelt in the Rue Ferrou, within two steps of the Luxembourg. His apartment consisted of two small chambers, very nicely fitted up, in a furnished house, the hostess of which, still young and still really handsome, cast tender glances uselessly at him. Some fragments of past splendor appeared here and there upon the walls of this modest lodging. A sword, for example, richly embossed, which belonged by its make to the times of Francis I, the hilt of which alone, encrusted with precious stones, might be worth two hundred pistoles and which, nevertheless, in his moments of greatest distress, Athos had never pledged or offered for sale. It had long been an object of ambition for Porthos. Porthos would have given ten years of his life to possess this sword. One day, when he had an appointment with the Duchess, he endeavored even to borrow it of Athos. Athos, without saying anything, emptied his pockets, got together all his jewels, purses, aiguillettes, and gold chains, and offered them all to Porthos. But as to the sword, he said it was sealed to its place and should never quit it, until its master should call himself quit his lodgings. In addition to the sword, there was a portrait representing a nobleman of the time of Henry the Third, dressed with the greatest elegance, and who wore the order of the Holy Ghost. And this portrait had certain resemblances of lines with Athos, certain family likenesses which indicated that this great noble, a knight of the order of the king, was his ancestor. Besides these, a casket of magnificent gold work, with the same arms as the sword and the portrait, formed a middle ornament to the mantelpiece, and assorted badly with the rest of the furniture. Athos always carried the key of this coffer about him. But he one day opened it before Porthos, and Porthos was convinced that this coffer contained nothing but letters and papers, love letters and family papers, no doubt. Porthos lived in an apartment, large in size and of very sumptuous appearance, in the Rue du Vieux Colombier. Every time he passed with a friend before his windows, at one of which Mousqueton was sure to be placed in full livery, 
Porthos raised his head and his hand and said, "'That is my abode.' but he was never to be found at home he never invited anybody to go up with him and no one could form an idea of what his sumptuous apartment contained in the shape of real riches as to aramis he dwelt in a little lodging composed of a boudoir an eating-room and a bedroom which room situated as the others were on the ground floor looked out upon a little fresh green garden shady and impenetrable to the eyes of his neighbours with regard to d'artagnan we know how he was lodged and we have already made acquaintance with his lackey master planchet d'artagnan who was by nature very curious as people generally are who possess the genius of intrigue did all he could to make out who athos porthos and aramis really were for under these pseudonyms each of these young men concealed his family name athos in particular who a league away savoured of nobility he addressed himself then to porthos to gain information respecting athos and aramis and to aramis in order to learn something of porthos unfortunately porthos knew nothing of the life of his silent companion but what revealed itself it was said athos had met with great crosses in love and that a frightful treachery had for ever poisoned the life of this gallant man what could this treachery be all the world was ignorant of it as to porthos except his real name as was the case with those of his two comrades his life was very easily known vain and indiscreet it was as easy to see through him as through a crystal the only thing to mislead the investigator would have been belief in all the good things he said of himself with respect to aramis though having the air of having nothing secret about him he was a young fellow made up of mysteries answering little to questions put to him about others and having learned from him the report which prevailed concerning the success of the musketeer with a princess wished to gain a little insight into the amorous adventures of his interlocutor and you my dear companion said he you speak of the baronesses countesses and princesses of others pardieu i spoke of them because porthos talked of them himself because he had paraded all these fine things before me but be assured my dear monsieur d'artagnan that if i had obtained them from any other source or if they had been confided to me there exists no confessor more discreet than myself oh i don't doubt that replied d'artagnan but it seems to me that you are terribly familiar with coats of arms a certain embroidered handkerchief for instance to which i owe the honour of your acquaintance this time aramis was not angry but assumed the most modest air and replied in a friendly tone my dear friend do not forget that i wish to belong to the church and that i avoid all mundane opportunities the handkerchief you saw had not been given to me but it had been forgotten and left at my house by one of my friends i was obliged to pick it up in order not to compromise him and the lady he loves as for myself i neither have nor desire to have a mistress following in that respect the very judicious example of athos who has none any more than i have but what the devil you are not a priest you are a musketeer a musketeer for a time my friend as the cardinal says a musketeer against my will but a churchman at heart believe me athos and porthos dragged me into this to occupy me i had at the moment of being ordained a little difficulty with but but that would not interest you and i am taking up your valuable time oh, not at all it interests me very much cried d'artagnan and at this moment i have absolutely nothing to do yes but i have my bravery to repeat answered aramis then some verses to compose which madame d'aiguillon begged of me then i must go to rue saint honore in order to purchase some rouge for madame de chevreuse so you see my dear friend that if you are not in a hurry i am very much in a hurry aramis held out his hand in a cordial manner to his young companion and took leave of him 
notwithstanding all the pains he took d'artagnan was unable to learn any more concerning his three new-made friends he formed therefore the resolution of believing for the present all that was said of their past hoping for more certain and extended revelations in the future in the meanwhile he looked upon athos as an achilles porthos as an ajax and aramis as a joseph as to the rest the life of the four young friends was joyous enough athos played and that as a rule unfortunately nevertheless he never borrowed a sou of his companions although his purse was ever at their service and when he had played upon honor he always awakened his creditor by six o'clock the next morning to pay his debt of the preceding evening porthos had his fits on the days when he won he was insolent and ostentatious if he lost he disappeared completely for several days after which he reappeared with a pale face and thinner person but with money in his purse as to aramis he never played he was the worst musketeer and the most unconvivial companion imaginable he had always something or other to do sometimes in the midst of dinner when every one under the attraction of wine and in the warmth of conversation believed they had two or three hours longer to enjoy themselves at table aramis looked at his watch arose with a bland smile and took leave of the company to go as he said to consult a casuist with whom he had an appointment at other times he would return home to write a treatise and requested his friends not to disturb him at this athos would smile with his charming melancholy smile which so became his noble countenance and porthos would drink swearing that aramis would never be anything but a village cure planchet d'artagnan's valet supported his good fortune nobly he received thirty sous per day and for a month he returned to his lodgings gay as a chaffinch and affable toward his master when the wind of adversity began to blow upon the housekeeping of the rue des fossoyeurs that is to say when the forty pistoles of king louis the thirteenth were consumed or nearly so he commenced complaints which athos thought nauseous porthos indecent and aramis ridiculous athos counseled d'artagnan to dismiss the fellow porthos was of the opinion that he should give him a good thrashing first and aramis contended that a master should never attend to anything but the civilities paid to him this is all very easy for you to say replied d'artagnan for you athos who live like a dumb man with grimaud who forbid him to speak and consequently never exchange ill words with him for you porthos who carry matters in such a magnificent style and are a god to your valet mousqueton and for you aramis who always abstracted by your theological studies inspire your servant bazin a mild religious man with a profound respect but for me who am without any settled means and without resources for me who am neither a musketeer nor even a guardsman what am i to do to inspire either the affection the terror or the respect in planchet this is serious answered the three friends it is a family affair it is with valets as with wives they must be placed at once upon the footing in which you wish them to remain reflect upon it d'artagnan did reflect and resolved to thrash planchet provisionally which he did with the conscientiousness that d'artagnan carried into everything after having well beaten him he forbade him to leave his service without his permission for added he the future cannot fail to mend i inevitably look for better times your fortune is therefore made if you remain with me and i am too good a master to allow you to miss such a chance by granting you the dismissal you require this manner of acting roused much respect for d'artagnan's policy among the musketeers planchet was equally seized with admiration and said no more about going away the life of the four young men had become fraternal d'artagnan who had no settled habits of his own as he came from his province into the midst of his world quite new to him fell easily into the habits of his friends 
They rose about eight o'clock in the winter, about six in the summer, and went to take the countersign and see how things went on at Monsieur de Treville's. D'Artagnan, although he was not a musketeer, performed the duty of one with remarkable punctuality. He went on guard because he always kept company with whoever of his friends was on duty. He was well known at the Hotel of the Musketeers, where everyone considered him a good comrade. Monsieur de Treville, who had appreciated him at the first glance and who bore him a real affection, never ceased recommending him to the king. On their side, the three musketeers were much attached to their young comrade. The friendship which united these four men, and the need they felt of seeing another three or four times a day, whether for dueling, business, or pleasure, caused them to be continually running after one another like shadows, and the inseparables were constantly to be met with seeking one another. From the Luxembourg to the Place Saint-Sulpice, or from the Rue de vieux Colombier to the Luxembourg. In the meanwhile, the promises of Monsieur de Treville went on prosperously. One fine morning the king commanded Monsieur de Chevalier d'Essersart to admit D'Artagnan as a cadet in his company of guards. D'Artagnan, with a sigh, donned his uniform, which he would have exchanged for that of a musketeer at the expense of ten years of his existence. But Monsieur de Treville promised this favor after a novitiate of two years, a novitiate which might besides be abridged if an opportunity should present itself for D'Artagnan to render the king any signal service or to distinguish himself by some brilliant action. Upon this promise D'Artagnan withdrew and the next day he began his service. Then it became the turn of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis to mount guard with D'Artagnan when he was on duty. The company of Monsieur le Chevalier d'Essersart thus received four instead of one when it admitted D'Artagnan. Chapter 8 Concerning a Court Intrigue In the meantime, the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth, like all other things of this world, after having had a beginning, had an end. And after this end, our four companions began to be somewhat embarrassed. At first, Athos supported the association for a time with his own means. Porthos succeeded him, and thanks to one of those disappearances to which he was accustomed, he was able to provide for the wants of all for a fortnight. At last it became Aramis's turn, who performed it with a good grace, and who succeeded, as he said by selling some theological books, in procuring a few pistoles. Then, as they had been accustomed to do, they had recourse to M. de Treville, who made some advances on their pay, but these advances could not go far with three musketeers who were already much in arrears, and a guardsman who as yet had no pay at all. At length, when they found they were likely to be really in want, they got together, as a last effort, eight or ten pistoles, with which Porthos went to the gambling table. Unfortunately he was in a bad vein. He lost all together with twenty-five pistoles for which he had given his word. Then the inconvenience became distress. The hungry friends, followed by their lackeys, were seen haunting the quays and guard-rooms, picking up among their friends abroad all the dinners they could meet with, for according to the advice of Aramis it was prudent to sow repasts right and left in prosperity in order to reap a few in time of need. Athos was invited four times, and each time took his friends and their lackeys with him. Porthos had six occasions, and contrived in the same manner that his friends should partake of them. Aramis had eight of them. He was a man, as must have been already perceived, who made but little noise, and yet was much sought after. As to D'Artagnan, who as yet knew nobody in the capital, he only found one chocolate breakfast at the house of a priest of his own province, and one dinner at the house of a cornet of the guards. 
he took his army to the priests, where they devoured as much provision as would have lasted him for two months, and to the cornets, who performed wonders. But, as Planchet said, people do not eat once for all time, even when they eat a good deal. D'Artagnan thus felt himself humiliated in having only procured one meal and a half for his companions, as the breakfast at the priest's could only be counted as half a repast, in return for the feasts which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis had procured him. He fancied himself a burden to the society, forgetting in his perfectly juvenile good faith that he had fed this society for a month. And he set his mind actively to work. He reflected that this coalition of four young, brave, enterprising, and active men ought to have some other object than swaggering walks, fencing lessons, and practical jokes, more or less witty. In fact, four men such as they were, four men devoted to one another, from their purses to their lives, four men always supporting one another, never yielding, executing singly or together the resolutions formed in common, four arms threatening the four cardinal points, or turning toward a single point, must inevitably, either subterraneously, in open day, by mining, in the trench, by cunning or by force, open themselves away toward the object they wish to attain, however well it might be defended, or however distant it may seem. The only thing that astonished D'Artagnan was that his friends had never thought of this. He was thinking by himself, and even seriously racking his brain to find a direction for this single force four times multiplied, with which he had no doubt, as with the lever for which Archimedes sought, they should succeed in moving the world, when someone tapped gently at his door. D'Artagnan awakened Planchet and ordered him to open it. From this phrase, D'Artagnan awakened Planchet, the reader must not suppose it was night, or that day was hardly come. No, it had just struck four. Planchet, two hours before, had asked his master for some dinner, and he had answered him with the proverb, He who sleeps dines, and Planchet dined by sleeping. A man was introduced, of simple mien, who had the appearance of a tradesman. Planchet, by way of dessert, would have liked to hear the conversation, but the citizen declared to D'Artagnan that, what he had to say being important and confidential, he desired to be left alone with him. D'Artagnan dismissed Planchet, and requested his visitor to be seated. There was a moment of silence during which the two men looked at each other, as if to make a preliminary acquaintance, after which D'Artagnan bowed, as a sign that he listened. "'I have heard Monsieur D'Artagnan spoken of as a very brave young man,' said the citizen, "'and this reputation which he justly enjoys has decided me to confide a secret to him.' "'Speak, monsieur, speak,' said D'Artagnan, who instinctively scented something advantageous. The citizen made a fresh pause, and continued, "'I have a wife who is seamstress to the queen, monsieur, and who is not deficient in either virtue or beauty. I was induced to marry her about three years ago, although she had but very little dowry, because monsieur Laporte, the queen's cloak-bearer, is her godfather, and befriends her. "'Well, monsieur?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Well,' resumed the citizen, "'well, monsieur, my wife was abducted yesterday morning, as she was coming out of her workroom. "'And by whom was your wife abducted?' "'I know nothing surely, monsieur, but I suspect someone.' And who is the person whom you suspect? A man who has pursued her for a long time. The devil! But allow me to tell you, monsieur, continued the citizen, that I am convinced that there is less love 
than politics in all this. Less love than politics, replied D'Artagnan, with a reflective air. And what do you suspect? I do not know whether I ought to tell you what I suspect. Monsieur, I beg you to observe that I ask you absolutely nothing. It is you who have come to me. It is you who have told me that you had a secret to confide in me. Act, then, as you think proper. There is still time to withdraw. Uh, no, monsieur, no, no, no. You appear to be an honest young man, and I will have confidence in you. I believe, then, that it is not on account of any intrigues of her own that my wife has been arrested, but because of those of a lady much greater than herself. Ah, ah, can it be on account of the amours of Madame de Boitrecy? said D'Artagnan, wishing to have the air in the eyes of the citizen of being posted as to court affairs. Higher, monsieur, higher! Of Madame d'Auguillon? Still higher! Of Madame de Chevreuse? Of the... D'Artagnan checked himself. Yes, monsieur! replied the terrified citizen, in a tone so low that he was scarcely audible. "'And with whom?' "'With whom can it be, if not the Duke of—' "'The Duke of—' "'Yes, monsieur,' replied the citizen, giving a still fainter intonation to his voice. "'But how do you know all this?' "'How do I know?' "'Yes, how do you know it? "'No half-confidence, or—you understand?' I know it from my wife, monsieur, from my wife herself. Who learns it from whom? From monsieur Laporte. Did I not tell you that she was the goddaughter of monsieur Laporte, the confidential man of the queen? Well, monsieur Laporte placed her near her majesty in order that our poor queen might at least have someone in whom she could place confidence. Abandoned as she is by the king, watched as she is by the cardinal, betrayed as she is by everybody. Ah, ah, it begins to develop itself, said D'Artagnan. Now, my wife came home four days ago, monsieur. One of her conditions was that she should come home and see me twice a week. For, as I had the honour to tell you, my wife loves me dearly. My wife, then, came and confided to me that the Queen, at that very moment, entertained great fears. Truly, yes, the Cardinal, as it appears, pursues her and persecutes her more than ever. He cannot pardon her the history of the Sarabande. You know the history of the Sarabande? Pardieu, know it, replied D'Artagnan, who knew nothing about it, but who wished to appear to know everything that was going on. So that now it is no longer hatred, but vengeance. Indeed. And the queen believes... Well, what does the queen believe? She believes that someone has written to the Duke of Buckingham in her name. In the Queen's name? Yes, to make him come to Paris. And when once come to Paris, to draw him into some snare. The devil! But your wife, monsieur, what has she to do with all this? Her devotion to the Queen is known, and they wish either to remove her from her mistress or to intimidate her, in order to obtain Her Majesty's secrets, or to seduce her and make use of her as a spy. That is likely, said D'Artagnan. But the man who has abducted her, do you know him? I have told you that I believe I know him. His name? I do not know that. What I do know is that he is a creature of the cardinal, his evil genius. But you have seen him. Yes, my wife pointed him out to me one day. Has he anything remarkable about him by which one may recognize him? 
Oh, certainly, he is a noble of very lofty carriage, black hair, swarthy complexion, piercing eye, white teeth, and has a scar on his temple. A scar on his temple, cried D'Artagnan, and with that, white teeth, a piercing eye, dark complexion, black hair, and haughty carriage, why, that's my man of Mung. He is your man, do you say? Yes, yes, but that has nothing to do with it. No, no, I'm wrong. On the contrary, that simplifies the matter greatly. If your man is mine, with one blow I shall obtain two revenges, that's all. But where to find this man? I know not. Have you no information as to his abiding place? None. One day, as I was conveying my wife back to the Louvre, he was coming out as she was going in, and she showed him to me. The devil! The devil! murmured D'Artagnan. All this is vague enough. From whom have you learned of the abduction of your wife? From Monsieur Laporte. Did he give you any details? He knew none himself. And you have learned nothing from any other quarter? Yes, I have received... What? I fear I am committing a great imprudence. You always come back to that. But I must make you see this time that it is too late to retreat. I do not retreat. Mordieu! cried the citizen, swearing, in order to rouse his courage. Besides, by the faith of Bonacieux, you call yourself Bonacieux, interrupted D'Artagnan. Yes, that is my name. Ah, you said then, by the word of Bonacieux, uh, pardon me for interrupting you, but it appears to me that the name is familiar to me. Possibly, monsieur, I am your landlord. Ah, ah, said D'Artagnan, half rising and bowing, you are my landlord. "'Yes, monsieur, yes, and as it is three months since you have been here, and though distracted as you must be in your important occupations, you have forgotten to pay me my rent, as I say, I have not tormented you a single instant. I thought you would appreciate my delicacy.' "'How can it be otherwise, my dear Bonacieux?' replied D'Artagnan. "'Trust me, I am fully grateful for your unparalleled conduct, and if, as I told you, I can be of any service to you, I believe you, monsieur, I believe you, and as I was about to say, by the word of Bonacieux, I have confidence in you. Finish, then, what you were about to say.' The citizen took a paper from his pocket, and presented it to D'Artagnan. "'A letter,' said the young man, "'which I received this morning.' D'Artagnan opened it, and as the day was beginning to decline, he approached the window to read it. The citizen followed him. "'Do not seek your wife,' read D'Artagnan. She will be restored to you when there is no longer occasion for her. If you make a single step to find her, you are lost. That's pretty positive, continued D'Artagnan. But after all, it is but a menace. Yes, but that menace terrifies me. I am not a fighting man at all, monsieur. I am afraid of the Bastille. Hm, said D'Artagnan. I have no greater regard for the Bastille than you— if it were nothing but a sword-thrust, why then? I have counted upon you on this occasion, monsieur. Yes? Seeing you constantly surrounded by musketeers of a very superb appearance, and knowing that these musketeers belonged to monsieur de Treville, and were consequently enemies of the cardinal, I thought that you and your friends, while rendering justice to your poor queen, would be pleased to play his eminence an ill turn. Without doubt. And then I have thought that considering three months' lodging, about which I have said nothing, yes, yes, you have already given me that reason, and I find it excellent. 
reckoning still further that as long as you do me the honour to remain in my house i shall never speak to you about rent very kind and uh, adding to this if there be need of it uh, meaning to offer you fifty pistoles if against all probability uh, you should be short at the present moment admirable you are rich then my dear monsieur bonacieux i am comfortably off monsieur that is all i have uh, scraped together some such thing as an income of two or three thousand crowns at the abadashery business but more particularly in venturing some funds in the last voyage of the celebrated navigator jean moquet so that you understand monsieur but cried the citizen what demanded d'artagnan whom do i see yonder where in the street facing the window in the embrasure of that door a man wrapped in a cloak it is he cried d'artagnan and the citizen at the same time each having recognized his man ah this time cried d'artagnan springing to his sword this time he will not escape me drawing his sword from its scabbard he rushed out of the apartment on the staircase he met athos and porthos who were coming to see him they separated and d'artagnan rushed between them like a dart Pah! where are you going cried the two musketeers in a breath the man of mon replied d'artagnan and disappeared d'artagnan had more than once related to his friends his adventure with the stranger as well as the apparition of the beautiful foreigner to whom this man had confided some important missive the opinion of athos was that d'artagnan had lost his letter in the skirmish a gentleman in his opinion and according to d'artagnan's portrait of him the stranger must be a gentleman would be incapable of the baseness of stealing a letter porthos saw nothing in all this but a love-meeting given by a lady to a cavalier or by a cavalier to a lady which had been disturbed by the presence of d'artagnan and his yellow horse aramis said that as these sorts of affairs were mysterious it was better not to fathom them they understood then from the few words which escaped from d'artagnan what affair was in hand and as they thought that overtaking his man or losing sight of him d'artagnan would return to his rooms they kept on their way when they entered d'artagnan's chamber it was empty the landlord dreading the consequences of the encounter which was doubtless about to take place between the young man and the stranger had consistent with the character he had given himself judged it prudent to decamp end of chapter eight chapter nine d'artagnan shows himself as athos and porthos had foreseen at the expiration of a half-hour d'artagnan returned he had again missed his man who had disappeared as if by enchantment d'artagnan had run sword in hand through all the neighboring streets but had found nobody resembling the man he sought for then he came back to the point where perhaps he ought to have begun and that was to knock at the door against which the stranger had leaned but this proved useless for though he knocked ten or twelve times in succession, no one answered, and some of the neighbours, who put their noses out of their windows or were brought to their doors by the noise, had assured him that that house, all the openings of which were tightly closed, had not been inhabited for six months. While d'Artagnan was running through the streets and knocking at doors, Aramis had joined his companions, so that on returning home d'Artagnan found the reunion complete. Well, cried the three musketeers all together on seeing d'artagnan enter with his brow covered with perspiration and his countenance upset with anger well cried he throwing his sword upon the bed this man must be the devil in person he has disappeared like a phantom like a shade like a spectre do you believe in apparitions asked athos of porthos i never believe in anything i have not seen and as I never have seen apparitions, I don't believe in them. The Bible, said Aramis, make our belief in them a law. 
the ghost of Samuel appeared to Saul, and this is an article of faith that I should be very sorry to see any doubt thrown upon Porthos. At all events, man or devil, body or shadow, illusion or reality, this man is born for my damnation. For his flight has caused us to miss a glorious affair, gentlemen, an affair by which there were a hundred pistoles and perhaps more to be gained. How is that? cried Porthos and Aramis in a breath. As to Athos, faithful to his system of reticence, he contented himself with interrogating D'Artagnan by a look. Planchet, said D'Artagnan to his domestic, who just then insinuated his head through the half-open door in order to catch some fragments of the conversation. Go down to my landlord, Monsieur Bonacieux, and ask him to send me half a dozen bottles of Beaugency wine. I prefer that. Ah, ah, you have credit with your landlord, then? asked Porthos. Yes, replied D'Artagnan, from this very day. And mind, if the wine is bad, we will send him to find better. We must use and not abuse, said Aramis sententiously. I always said that D'Artagnan had the longest head of the four, said Athos, who, having uttered his opinion, to which D'Artagnan replied with a bow, immediately resumed his accustomed silence. But come, what is this about? asked Porthos. Yes, said Aramis. Impart it to us, my dear friend, unless the honour of any lady be hazarded by this confidence. In that case, you would do better to keep it to yourself. Be satisfied, replied D'Artagnan. The honour of no one will have cause to complain of what I have to tell. He then related to his friends, word for word, all that had passed between him and his host, and how the man who had abducted the wife of his worthy landlord was the same with whom he had had the difference at the hostelry of the Jolly Miller. "'Your affair is not bad,' said Athos, after having tasted like a connoisseur, and indicated by a nod of his head that he thought the wine good. "'And one may draw fifty or sixty pistoles from this good man.' And there only remains to ascertain whether these fifty or sixty pistoles are worth the risk of four heads. But observe, cried D'Artagnan, that there is a woman in the affair, a woman carried off, a woman who is doubtless threatened, tortured perhaps, and all because she is faithful to her mistress. Beware, D'Artagnan, beware, said Aramis. You grow a little too warm, in my opinion, about the fate of Madame Bonacieux. Woman was created for our destruction and it is from her we inherit all our miseries. At this speech of Aramis, the brow of Athos became clouded, and he bit his lips. It is not Madame Bonacieux about whom I am anxious, cried D'Artagnan, but the Queen, whom the King abandons, whom the Cardinal persecutes, and who sees the heads of all her friends fall, one after the other. But why does she love what we hate most in the world, the Spaniards and the English? Spain is her country, replied D'Artagnan, and it is very natural that she should love the Spanish, who are the children of the same soil as herself. As to the second reproach, I have heard it said that she does not love the English, but an English man. Well, and by my faith, said Athos, it must be acknowledged that this Englishman is worthy of being loved. I never saw a man with a nobler air than his. "'Without reckoning that he dresses as nobody else can,' said Porthos. "'I was at the Louvre on the day when he scattered his pearls, "'and, par Dieu, I picked up two that I sold for ten pistoles each. "'Do you know him, Aramis?' "'As well as you do, gentlemen, "'for I was among those who seized him in the garden at Amiens, "'into which Monsieur Putange, the Queen's equerry, introduced me. "'I was at school at the time.' and the adventure appeared to me to be cruel for the king. Which would not prevent me, said D'Artagnan, if I knew where the Duke of Buckingham was, from taking him by the hand and conducting him to the queen, were it only to enrage the cardinal, and if we could find means to play him a sharp turn, I vow that I would voluntarily risk my head in doing it. And did the mercer, rejoined Athos, tell you, D'Artagnan, that the queen thought that Buckingham had been brought over by a forged letter? She is afraid so. Wait a minute, then, said Aramis. What for? demanded Porthos. Go on, while I endeavour to recall circumstances. 
"'And now I am convinced,' said D'Artagnan, "'that this abduction of the Queen's woman is connected with the events of which we are speaking, "'and perhaps with the presence of Buckingham in Paris.' "'The Gascon is full of ideas,' said Porthos, with admiration. "'I like to hear him talk,' said Athos. "'His dialect amuses me.' "'Gentlemen,' cried Aramis, "'listen to this.' "'Listen to Aramis,' said his three friends. "'Yesterday I was at the house of a doctor of theology, "'whom I sometimes consult about my studies.' "'Athos smiled. "'He resides in a quiet corner.' continued Aramis. His tastes and his profession require it. Now, at the moment when I left his house— Here Aramis paused. Well, cried his auditors, at the moment you left his house— Aramis appeared to make a strong inward effort, like a man who, in the full relation of a falsehood, finds himself stopped by some unforeseen obstacle. But the eyes of his three companions were fixed upon him, their ears were wide open, and there were no means of retreat. "'This doctor has a niece,' continued Aramis. "'Ah, he has a niece,' interrupted Porthos. "'A very respectable lady,' said Aramis. The three friends burst into laughter. Uh, "'If you laugh, you doubt me,' replied Aramis. "'You shall know nothing.' "'We believe like Mohammedans, and are as mute as tombstones,' said Athos. "'I will continue, then,' resumed Aramis. "'This niece comes sometimes to see her uncle, "'and by chance was there yesterday at the same time that I was, "'and it was my duty to offer to conduct her to her carriage.' "'Ah, she has a carriage, then, this niece of the doctor,' "'interrupted Porthos, one of whose faults was a great looseness of tongue. "'A nice acquaintance, my friend.' "'Porthos,' replied Aramis, I have had the occasion to observe to you more than once that you are very indiscreet, and that is injurious to you among the women. Gentlemen, gentlemen, cried D'Artagnan, who began to get a glimpse of the result of the adventure. The thing is serious. Let us try not to jest, if we can. Go on, Aramis, go on. All at once a tall, dark gentleman, just like yours, D'Artagnan. The same, perhaps, said he. Possibly, continued Aramis, came toward me, accompanied by five or six men, who followed about ten paces behind him, and in the politest tone, Monsieur Duke, said he to me, and you, madame, continued he, addressing the lady on my arm, the doctor's niece. Hold your tongue, Porthos, said Athos, you are insupportable. "'Will you enter this carriage in that without offering the least resistance, without making the least noise?' "'He took you for Buckingham!' cried D'Artagnan. "'I believe so,' replied Aramis. "'But the lady?' asked Porthos. "'He took her for the Queen,' said D'Artagnan. "'Just so,' replied Aramis. "'The Gascon is the devil!' cried Athos. "'Nothing escapes him!' "'The fact is,' said Porthos, "'Aramis is of the same height, and something of the shape of the duke. "'But it nevertheless appears to me that the dress of a musketeer "'I wore an enormous cloak,' said Aramis. "'In the month of July?' "'The devil!' said Porthos. "'Is the doctor afraid that you may be recognised?' "'I can comprehend that the spy may have been deceived by the person, but the face—' "'I had a large hat,' said Aramis. "'Oh, good Lord!' cried Porthos. "'What precautions for the study of theology! "'Gentlemen, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, "'do not let us lose our time in jesting. "'Let us separate, and let us seek the mercer's wife. "'That is the key of the intrigue.' "'A woman of such inferior condition. "'Can you believe so?' said Porthos, "'protruding his lips with contempt. "'She is goddaughter to Laporte, "'the confidential valet of the Queen. "'Have I not told you so, gentlemen?' "'Besides, it has perhaps been Her Majesty's calculation to seek on this occasion for support so lowly. "'High heads expose themselves from afar, and the Cardinal is long-sighted.' "'Well,' said Porthos, "'in the first place make a bargain with the mercer, and a good bargain.' "'That's useless,' said D'Artagnan, "'for I believe if he does not pay us, we shall be well enough paid by another party.' "'At this moment,' 
A sudden noise of footsteps was heard upon the stairs. The door was thrown violently open, and the unfortunate Mercer rushed into the chamber in which the council was held. "'Save me, gentlemen, for the love of heaven, save me!' cried he. "'There are four men come to arrest me. Save me! Save me!' Porthos and Aramis arose. "'A moment!' cried D'Artagnan, making them a sign to replace in the scabbard their half-drawn swords. "'It is not courage that is needed, it is prudence.' "'And yet,' cried Porthos, "'we will not leave.' "'You will leave D'Artagnan to act as he thinks proper,' said Athos. "'He has, I repeat, the longest head of the four, "'and for my part I declare that I will obey him. "'Do as you think best, D'Artagnan.' "'At this moment the four guards appeared at the door of the antechamber, "'but seeing four musketeers standing and their swords by their sides, "'they hesitated about going further. "'Come in, gentlemen, come in,' called D'Artagnan. "'You are here in my apartment, "'and we are all faithful servants of the king and cardinal.' "'Then, gentlemen, you will not oppose our executing the orders we have received?' asked one, who appeared to be the leader of the party. "'On the contrary, gentlemen, we would assist you if it were necessary.' "'What does he say?' grumbled Porthos. "'You are a simpleton,' said Athos. "'Silence!' "'But you promised me,' whispered the poor mercer. "'We can only save you by being free ourselves,' replied D'Artagnan in a rapid low tone. "'And if we appear inclined to defend you, they will arrest us with you.' It seems, nevertheless, come, gentlemen, come, said D'Artagnan aloud. I have no motive for defending monsieur. I saw him today for the first time, and he can tell you on what occasion. He came to demand the rent of my lodging. Is that not true, monsieur Bonacieux? Answer. It is the very truth, cried the mercer, but monsieur does not tell you. Silence! With respect to me, silence. With respect to my friends, silence about the queen above all, or you will ruin everybody without saving yourself. Come. "'Come, gentlemen, remove the fellow.' "'And D'Artagnan pushed the half-stupefied mercer among the guards, saying to him, "'You are a shabby old fellow, my dear. "'You come to demand money of me, of a musketeer, to prison with him. "'Gentlemen, once more, take him to prison and keep him out of key as long as possible. "'That will give me time to pay him.' "'The officers were full of thanks and took away their prey. "'As they were going down, D'Artagnan laid his hand on the shoulder of their leader.' "'May I not drink to your health, and you to mine?' said D'Artagnan, filling two glasses with the Beaugency wine, which he had obtained from the liberality of Monsieur Bonacieux. "'That will do me great honour, said the leader of the posse, "'and I accept thankfully.' "'Then to yours, monsieur, what is your name?' "'Beaurenard. "'Monsieur Beaurenard. "'To yours, my gentleman. "'What is your name in your turn, if you please?' "'D'Artagnan.' "'To yours, monsieur.' "'And above all others,' cried D'Artagnan, as if carried away by his enthusiasm, "'to that of the king and the cardinal.' And "'The leader of the posse would perhaps have doubted the sincerity of D'Artagnan "'if the wine had been bad, but the wine was good, and he was convinced. "'What diabolical villainy you've performed here,' said Porthos, "'when the officer had rejoined his companions, and the four friends found themselves alone. "'Shame! Shame for four musketeers to allow an unfortunate fellow who cried for help "'to be arrested in their midst!' "'and a gentleman to hobnob with a bailiff!' "'Poor Thos, said Aramis. "'Athos has already told you that you are a simpleton, "'and I am quite of his opinion. "'D'Artagnan, you are a great man, "'and when you occupy Monsieur de Treville's place, "'I will come and ask your influence to secure me an abbey.' "'Well, I am in a maze, said Porthos. "'Do you approve of what D'Artagnan has done?' "'Pabla! Indeed I do!' said Athos. I not only approve of what he has done, but I congratulate him upon it. And now, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, without stopping to explain his conduct to Porthos, all for one, one for all, that is our motto, is it not? And yet, said Porthos, hold out your hand and swear, cried Athos and Aramis at once. Overcome by example, grumbling to himself, nevertheless Porthos stretched out his hand, and the four friends repeated with one voice the formula dictated by D'Artagnan. All for one! One for all! That's well. Now, let us every one retire to his own home, said D'Artagnan, as if he had done nothing but command all his life. And attention! For from this moment we are at feud with the Cardinal. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 A Mouse Trap in the Seventeenth Century the invention of the mousetrap does not date from our days. As soon as societies, informing, had invented any kind of police, that police invented mousetraps. 
as perhaps our readers are not familiar with the slang of the rue de jerusalem and as it is fifteen years since we applied this word for the first time to this thing allow us to explain to them what is a mouse-trap when in a house of whatever kind it may be an individual suspected of any crime is arrested the arrest is held secret four or five men are placed in an ambuscade in the front room the door is opened to all who knock it is closed after them and they are arrested so that at the end of two or three days they have in their power almost all the habitues of the establishment and that is a mouse trap the apartment of monsieur bonacieux then became a mouse trap and whoever appeared there was taken and interrogated by the cardinal's people it must be observed that as a separate passage led to the first floor in which d'artagnan lodged those who called on him were exempted from this detention besides nobody came thither but the three musketeers they had all been engaged in earnest search and inquiries but had discovered nothing athos had even gone so far as to question m de treville a thing which considering the habitual reticence of the worthy musketeer had very much astonished his captain but m de treville knew nothing except that the last time he had seen the cardinal the king and the queen the cardinal looked very thoughtful the king uneasy and the redness of the queen's eyes donated that she had been sleepless or tearful but this last circumstance was not striking as the queen since her marriage had slept badly and wept much m de treville requested athos whatever might happen to be observant of his duty to the king but particularly to the queen begging him to convey his desires to his comrades as to d'artagnan he did not budge from his apartment he converted his chamber into an observatory from his windows he saw all the visitors who were caught then having removed a plank from his floor and nothing much remaining but a simple ceiling between him and the room beneath in which the interrogatories were made he heard all that passed between the inquisitors and the accused the interrogatories preceded by a minute search operated upon the persons arrested were almost always framed thus has madame bonacieux sent anything to you for her husband or any other person has monsieur bonacieux sent anything to you for his wife or for any other person has either of them confided anything to you by word of mouth if they knew anything they would not question people in this manner said d'artagnan to himself now what is it they want to know why they want to know if the duke of buckingham is in paris and if he has had or is likely to have an interview with the queen d'artagnan held on to this idea which from what he had heard was not wanting in probability in the meantime the mouse-trap continued in operation and likewise d'artagnan's vigilance on the evening of the day after the arrest of poor bonacieux as athos had just left d'artagnan to report at m de treville's and as nine o'clock had just struck and as planchette who had not yet made the bed was beginning his task a knocking was heard at the street door the door was instantly opened and shut some one was taken in the mouse-trap d'artagnan flew to his hole laid himself down on the floor at full length, and listened. Cries were soon heard, and then moans, which someone appeared to be endeavouring to stifle. There were no questions. "'The devil!' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'It seems like a woman. They search her, she resists, they use force, the scoundrels!' In spite of his prudence, D'Artagnan restrained himself with great difficulty from taking a part in the scene that was going on below but i tell you that i am the mistress of this house gentlemen i tell you i am madame bonacieux i tell you i belong to the queen cried the unfortunate woman madame bonacieux murmured d'artagnan can i be so lucky as to find what everybody is seeking for the voice became more and more indistinct a tumultuous movement shook the partition the victim resisted as much as a woman could resist four men pardon gentlemen par murmured the voice which could now only be heard in inarticulate sounds they are binding her they are going to drag her away cried d'artagnan to himself springing up from the floor my sword good it is by my side planchet monsieur run and seek athos porthos and aramis one of the three will certainly be at home perhaps all three tell them to take arms to come here and to run ah i remember athos is at monsieur de treville's but where are you going monsieur where are you going 
"'I am going down by the window in order to be there the sooner,' cried D'Artagnan. "'You put back the boards, sweep the floor, go out at the door, and run as I told you.' "'Oh, monsieur, monsieur, you will kill yourself!' cried Planchet. "'Hold your tongue, stupid fellow,' said D'Artagnan, and laying hold of the casement he let himself gently down from the first story, which fortunately was not very elevated, without doing himself the slightest injury. He then went straight to the door and knocked, murmuring, "'I will go myself and be caught in the mouse-trap, but woe be to the cat that shall pounce upon such a mouse!' The knocker had scarcely sounded under the hand of the young man before the tumult ceased, steps approached, the door was opened, and D'Artagnan, sword in hand, rushed into the rooms of Monsieur Bonacieux, the door of which, doubtless acted upon by a spring, closed after him. Then those who dwelt in Bonacieux's unfortunate house, together with the nearest neighbors, heard loud cries, stamping of feet, clashing of swords, and breaking of furniture. A moment after, those who, surprised by this tumult, had gone to their windows to learn the cause of it, saw the door open, and four men, clothed in black, not come out of it, but fly, like so many frightened crows, leaving on the ground and on the corners of the furniture feathers from their wings, that is to say, patches of their clothes and fragment of their cloaks. D'Artagnan was conqueror, without much effort, it must be confessed, for only one of the officers was armed, and even he defended himself for form's sake. It is true that the three others had endeavoured to knock the young man down with chairs, stools, and crockery, but two or three scratches made by Gascon's blade terrified them. Ten minutes sufficed for their defeat, and D'Artagnan remained master of the field of battle. The neighbours who had opened their windows, with the coolness particular to the inhabitants of Paris in these times of perpetual riots and disturbances, closed them again as soon as they saw the four men in black flee, their instinct telling them that for the time all was over. Besides, it began to grow late, and then, as today, people went to bed early in the quarter of Luxembourg. On being left alone with Madame Bonacieux, D'Artagnan turned toward her. The poor woman reclined where she had been left, half fainting upon an armchair. D'Artagnan examined her with a rapid glance. She was a charming woman of twenty-five or twenty-six years, with dark hair, blue eyes, and a nose slightly turned up, admirable teeth, and a complexion marbled with rose and opal. There, however, ended the signs which might have confounded her with a lady of rank. The hands were white, but without delicacy. The feet did not bespeak the woman of quality. Happily, D'Artagnan was not yet acquainted with such niceties. While D'Artagnan was examining Madame Bonacieux, and was, as we have said, close to her, he saw on the ground a fine cambric handkerchief, which he picked up, as was his habit, and at the corner of which he recognized the same cipher he had seen on the handkerchief which had nearly caused him and Aramis to cut each other's throat. From that time D'Artagnan had been cautious with respect to handkerchiefs with arms on them, and he therefore placed in the pocket of Madame Bonacieux the one he had just picked up. At that moment Madame Bonacieux recovered her senses. She opened her eyes, looked around her with terror, saw that the apartment was empty and that she was alone with her liberator. She extended her hands to him with a smile. Madame Bonacieux had the sweetest smile in the world. "'Ah, monsieur,' said she, "'you have saved me. Permit me to thank you.' "'Madame,' said D'Artagnan, "'I have only done what every gentleman would have done in my place. You owe me no thanks.' "'Oh, yes, monsieur, oh, yes, and I hope to prove to you that you have not served an ingrate.' but what could these men, whom I at first took for robbers, want with me? And why is Monsieur Bonacieux not here? Madame, these men were more dangerous than any robbers could have been, for they are the agents of the cardinal. And as to your husband, Monsieur Bonacieux, he is not here because he was yesterday evening conducted to the Bastille. My husband in the Bastille! cried Madame Bonacieux. Oh, my God, what has he done? "'Poor dear man, he is innocence itself!' And something like a faint smile lighted the still terrified features of the young woman. "'What has he done, madam?' said D'Artagnan. "'I believe that his only crime is to have at the same time the good fortune and the misfortune to be your husband.' "'But, monsieur, you know, then—' "'I know that you have been abducted, madame.' 
"'And by whom? Do you know him? Oh, if you know him, tell me!' "'By a man of from forty to forty-five years, with black hair, a dark complexion, and a scar on his left temple. "'That is he, that is he, but his name!' "'Ah, his name, I do not know that.' "'And did my husband know I had been carried off?' "'He was informed of it by a letter, written to him by the abductor himself.' "'And does he suspect,' said Madame Bonacieux, with some embarrassment, "'the cause of this event?' "'He attributed it, I believe, to a political cause. "'I doubted from the first, and now I think entirely as he does. "'Then my dear Monsieur Bonacieux has not suspected me a single instant. "'So far from it, madame, he was too proud of your prudence, and above all, of your love.' A second smile, almost imperceptible, stole over the rosy lips of the pretty young woman. But, continued D'Artagnan, how did you escape? I took advantage of a moment when they left me alone, and as I had known since morning the reason of my abduction, with the help of the sheets I let myself down from the window. Then, as I believed my husband would be at home, I hastened hither. To place yourself under his protection— "'Oh, no, poor dear man! I knew very well that he was incapable of defending me. But, as he could serve us in other ways, I wished to inform him. "'Of what?' "'Oh, that is not my secret. I must not, therefore, tell you.' "'Besides,' said D'Artagnan, "'pardon me, madame, if, guardsman as I am, I remind you of prudence. Besides, I believe we are not here in a very proper place for imparting confidences.' The men I have put to flight will return reinforced. If they find us here, we are lost. I have sent for three of my friends, but who knows whether they were at home? Yes, yes, you are right, cried the affrighted Madame Bonacieux. Let us fly, let us save ourselves. At these words she passed her arm under that of D'Artagnan, and urged him forward eagerly. But whither shall we fly, whither escape? Let us first withdraw from this house. Afterward we shall see. The young man and the young woman, without taking the trouble to shut the door after them, descended into the Rue des Fossoyeurs rapidly, turned into the Rue des Fossés Monsieur le Prince, and did not stop till they came to the Place Saint-Sulpice. And now what are we to do? And where do you wish me to conduct you? asked D'Artagnan. I am quite at a loss how to answer you, I admit, said Madame Bonacieux. My intention was to inform M. Laporte, through my husband, in order that M. Laporte might tell us precisely what had taken place at the Louvre in the last three days, and whether there is any danger in presenting myself there. But I, said D'Artagnan, can go and inform M. Laporte. No doubt you could, only there is one misfortune, and that is that M. Bonacieux is known at the Louvre, and would be allowed to pass, whereas you are not known there and the gate would be closed against you. "'Ah, bah,' said D'Artagnan, "'you have at some wicked of the Louvre a concierge who is devoted to you, and who, thanks to a password, would—' Madame Bonacieux looked earnestly at the young man. "'And if I give you this password,' said she, "'would you forget it as soon as you used it?' "'By my honour, by the faith of a gentleman,' said D'Artagnan, with an accent so truthful that no one could mistake it. "'Then I believe you. You appear to be a brave young man. Besides, your fortune may perhaps be the result of your devotedness.' "'I will do, without a promise and voluntarily, all that I can do to serve the king and be agreeable to the queen. Dispose of me, then, as a friend.' "'But I, where shall I go meanwhile?' "'Is there nobody from whose house Monsieur Laporte can come and fetch you?' "'No, I can trust nobody.' "'Stop,' said D'Artagnan. "'We are near Athos's door. "'Yes, here it is. "'Who is this Athos?' "'One of my friends. "'But if he should be at home and see me... "'He is not at home, and I will carry away the key, "'after having placed you in his apartment. "'But if he should return... "'Oh, he won't return, and if he should, "'he will be told that I have brought a woman with me, "'and that woman is in his apartment.' "'That will compromise me sadly, you know. "'Of what consequence? Nobody knows you. 
"'Besides, we are in a situation to overlook ceremony.' "'Come, then. Let us go to your friend's house. Where does he live?' "'Rue for rue, two steps from here. Let us go.' Both resumed their way. As D'Artagnan had foreseen, Athos was not within. He took the key, which was customarily given him as one of the family, ascended the stairs, and introduced Madame Bonacieux into the little apartment, of which we have given a description. "'You are at home,' said he. "'Remain here, fasten the door inside, and open it to nobody unless you hear three taps like this,' and he tapped thrice, two taps close together, and pretty hard, the other after an interval, and lighter. "'That is well,' said Madame Bonacieux. "'Now, in my turn, let me give you my instructions.' I am all attention. Present yourself at the wicket of the Louvre, on the side of the Rue de l'Echelle, and ask for Germain. Well, and then? He will ask you what you want, and you will answer by these two words, Tours and Brussels. He will at once put himself at your orders. And what shall I command him? To go and fetch Monsieur Laporte, the Queen's valet de chambre and when he shall have informed him and Monsieur Laporte is come, you will send him to me. That is well, but where and how shall I see you again? Do you wish to see me again? Certainly. Well, let that care be mine, and be at ease. I depend upon your word. You may. D'Artagnan bowed to Madame Bonacieux, darting at her the most loving glance that he could possibly concentrate upon her charming little person, and while he descended the stairs he heard the door closed and double-locked. In two bounds he was at the Louvre, as he entered the wicket of Lachelle, ten o'clock struck. All the events we have described had taken place within a half-hour. Everything fell out as Madame Bonacieux prophesied. On hearing the password, Germain bowed. In a few minutes Laporte was at the lodge. In two words, D'Artagnan informed him where Madame Bonacieux was. Laporte assured himself, by having it twice repeated, of the accurate address, and set off at a run. Hardly, however, had he taken ten steps before he returned. "'Young man,' said he to D'Artagnan, "'a suggestion.' "'What?' "'You may get into trouble by what has taken place.' "'You believe so?' "'Yes.' "'Have you any friend whose clock is too slow?' "'Well?' "'Go and call upon him, in order that he may give evidence of your having been with him at half-past nine. In a court of justice that is called an alibi.' D'Artagnan found his advice prudent. He took to his heels, and was soon at Monsieur de Treville's, but instead of going into the saloon with the rest of the crowd, he asked to be introduced to Monsieur de Treville's office. As D'Artagnan so constantly frequented the hotel, no difficulty was made in complying with his request, and a servant went to inform M. de Treville that his young compatriot, having something important to communicate, solicited a private audience. Five minutes after, M. de Treville was asking D'Artagnan what he could do to serve him, and what caused his visit at so late an hour. "'Pardon me, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan who had profited by the moment he had been left alone, to put back M. de Treville's clock three-quarters of an hour. But I thought, as it was yet only twenty-five minutes past nine, it was not too late to wait upon you. Twenty-five minutes past nine! cried M. de Treville, looking at the clock. Why, that's impossible! Look rather, monsieur, said D'Artagnan. The clock shows it. That's true, said M. de Treville. I believed it later— but what can I do for you? Then D'Artagnan told M. de Treville a long history about the Queen. He expressed to him the fears he entertained with respect to Her Majesty. He related to him what he had heard of the projects of the Cardinal with regard to Buckingham, and all with a tranquillity and candor of which M. de Treville was more the dupe, from having himself, as we had said, observed something fresh between the Cardinal, the King, and the Queen. As ten o'clock was striking, D'Artagnan left M. de Treville, who thanked him for his information, recommended him to have the service of the king and queen always at heart, and returned to the saloon. But at the foot of the stairs D'Artagnan remembered he had forgotten his cane. He consequently sprang up again, re-entered the office, 
with a turn of his finger set the clock right again, that it might not be perceived the next day that it had been put wrong, and certain from that time that he had a witness to prove his alibi, he ran downstairs, and soon found himself in the street. End of chapter 10chapter 11 in which the plot thickens his visit to monsieur de treville being paid the pensive d'artagnan took the longest way homeward on what was d'artagnan thinking that he strayed thus from his path gazing at the stars of heaven and sometimes sighing sometimes smiling he was thinking of madame bonacieux for an apprentice musketeer the young woman was almost an ideal of love. Pretty, mysterious, initiated in almost all the secrets of the court, which reflected such a charming gravity over her pleasing features, it might be surmised that she was not wholly unmoved. And this is an irresistible charm to novices in love. Moreover, D'Artagnan had delivered her from the hands of the demons who wished to search and ill-treat her, and this important service had established between them one of those sentiments of gratitude which so easily assume a more tender character. D'Artagnan already fancied himself, so rapid is the flight of our dreams upon the wings of imagination, accosted by a messenger from the young woman, who brought him some billet appointing a meeting, a gold chain, or a diamond. We have observed that young cavaliers received presents from their king without shame, let us add that in these times of lax morality they had no more delicacy with respect to the mistresses, and that the latter almost always left them valuable and durable remembrances, as if they essayed to conquer the fragility of their sentiments by the solidity of their gifts. Without a blush, men made their way in the world by the means of women blushing. Such as were only beautiful gave their beauty, whence, without doubt, comes the proverb, the most beautiful girl in the world can only give what she has. Such as were rich gave in addition a part of their money, and a vast number of heroes of that gallant period may be cited who would neither have won their spurs in the first place nor their battles afterward without the purse, more or less furnished, which their mistress fastened the saddle-bow. D'Artagnan owned nothing. Provincial diffidence, that slight varnish, the ephemeral flower, that down of the peach, had evaporated to the winds through the little orthodox counsels which the three musketeers gave their friend. D'Artagnan, following the strange custom of the times, considered himself at Paris as on a campaign, neither more nor less than if he had been in Flanders, Spain yonder, woman here. In each there was an enemy to contend with, and contributions to be levied. But we must say, at the present moment, D'Artagnan was ruled by a feeling much more noble and disinterested. The mercer had said that he was rich. The young man might easily guess that, with so weak a man as Madame Bonacieux, and interest was almost foreign to this commencement of love, which had been the consequence of it. We say almost, for the idea that a young, handsome, kind, and witty woman is at the same time rich, takes nothing from the beginning of love, but on the contrary strengthens it. There are, in affluence, a crowd of aristocratic cares and caprices which are highly becoming to beauty. A fine and white stocking, a silken robe, a lace kerchief, a pretty slipper on the foot, a tasty ribbon on the head, do not make an ugly woman pretty, but they make a pretty woman beautiful, without reckoning the hands, which gain by all this. The hands, among women particularly, to be beautiful, must be idle. Then D'Artagnan, as the reader from whom we have not concealed the state of his fortune very well knows, D'Artagnan was not a millionaire. He hoped to become one some day, but the time which in his own mind he fixed upon for this happy change was still far distant. In the meanwhile, how disheartening to see the woman one loves long for those thousands of nothings which constitute a woman's happiness, and be unable to give her those thousands of nothings. At least, when the woman is rich and the lover is not, that which he cannot offer she offers to herself, and although it is generally with her husband's money that she procures herself this indulgence, the gratitude for it seldom reverts to him. Then D'Artagnan, disposed to become the most tender of lovers, 
was at the same time a very devoted friend. In the midst of his amorous projects for the mercer's wife, he did not forget his friends. The pretty Madame Bonacieux was just the woman to walk with in the plain St. Denis, or in the fair of St. Germain, in company with Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, to whom D'Artagnan had often remarked this. Then one could enjoy charming little dinners, where one touches on one side of the hand of a friend, and on the other the foot of a mistress. Besides, on pressing occasions, in extreme difficulties, D'Artagnan would become the preserver of his friends. And Monsieur Bonacieux, whom D'Artagnan had pushed into the hands of the officers, denying him aloud, although he had promised in a whisper to save him. We are compelled to admit to our readers that D'Artagnan thought nothing about him in any way, or that if he did think of him, it was only to say to himself that he was very well where he was, wherever it might be. Love is the most selfish of all the passions. Let our readers reassure themselves. If D'Artagnan forgets his host, or appears to forget him, under the pretense of not knowing where he has been carried, we will not forget him, and we know where he is. But, for the moment, let us do as did the amorous Gascon. We will see, after the worthy mercer, later. D'Artagnan, reflecting on his future amours, addressing himself to the beautiful night, and smiling at the stars, ascended the Rue Cherish Midi, or Chase Midi, as it was then called. As he found himself in the quarter in which Aramis lived, he took it into his head to pay his friend a visit in order to explain the motives which had led him to said Planchet with a request that he would come immediately into the mouse trap. Now, if Aramis had been at home when Planchet came to his abode, he had doubtless hastened to the Rue des Fossoyeurs, and finding nobody there but his other two companions, perhaps, they would not be able to conceive what all this meant. This mystery required an explanation. At least, so D'Artagnan declared to himself. He likewise thought this was an opportunity for talking about pretty little Madame Bonacieux, of whom his head, if not his heart, was already full. We must never look for discretion in first love. First love is accompanied by such excessive joy that unless the joy be allowed to overflow, it will stifle you. Paris, for two hours past, had been dark and seemed a desert. Eleven o'clock sounded from all the clocks in the Faubourg St. Germain. It was delightful weather. D'Artagnan was passing along a lane on the spot where the Rue des Sauces is now situated, breathing the balmy emanations which were borne upon the wind from the Rue des Vaugirard, and which arose from the gardens, refreshed by the dews of evening and the breeze of night. From a distance resounded, deadened, however, by good shutters, the songs of the tipplers, enjoying themselves in the cabarets scattered along the plain. Arrived at the end of the lane, D'Artagnan turned to the left. The house in which Aramis dwelt was situated between the Rue Cassette and the Rue Servandoni. D'Artagnan had just passed the Rue Cassette, and had already perceived the door of his friend's house, shaded by a mass of sycamores and clematis which formed a vast arch opposite the front of it, when he perceived something like a shadow issuing from the Rue Servandoni. This something was enveloped in a cloak, and D'Artagnan at first believed it was a man. But by the smallness of the form, the hesitation of the walk, and the indecision of the step, he soon discovered that it was a woman. Further, this woman, as if not certain of the house she was seeking, lifted up her eyes to look around her, stopped, went backward, and then returned again. D'Artagnan was perplexed. "'Shall I go and offer her my services?' thought he. "'By her step she must be young. Perhaps she is pretty. Oh, yes!' But a woman who wanders in the streets at this hour only ventures out to meet her lover. If I should disturb a rendezvous, that would not be the best means of commencing an acquaintance. Meantime, the young woman continued to advance, counting the houses and windows. This was neither long nor difficult. There were but three hotels in this part of the street, and only two windows looking toward the road, one of which was in a pavilion parallel to that which Aramis occupied the other belonging to Aramis himself. Pardieu, said D'Artagnan to himself, to whose mind the niece of the theologian reverted. Pardieu, 
"'It would be droll if this belated dove should be in search of our friend's house. "'But on my soul it looks so. "'Ah, my dear Aramis, this time I shall find you out.' "'And D'Artagnan, making himself as small as he could, "'concealed himself in the darkest side of the street "'near a stone bench placed at the back of a niche. "'The young woman continued to advance, "'and in addition to the lightness of her step which had betrayed her, "'she emitted a little cough which denoted a sweet voice. D'Artagnan believed this cough to be a signal. Nevertheless, whether the cough had been answered by a similar signal which had fixed the irresolution of the nocturnal seeker, or whether without this aid she saw that she had arrived at the end of her journey, she resolutely drew near to Aramis's shutter, and tapped, at three equal intervals, with her bent finger. "'This is all very fine, dear Aramis,' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Ah, oh, monsieur hypocrite, I understand how you study theology.' The three blows were scarcely struck, when the inside blind was opened, and a light appeared through the panes of the outside shutter. "'Ah, ah,' said the listener, "'not through doors, but through windows. Ah, this visit was expected. We shall see the windows open, and the lady enter by escalade. Very pretty.' But, to the great astonishment of D'Artagnan, the shutter remained closed. Still more, the light which had shone for an instant disappeared, and all was again in obscurity. D'Artagnan thought this could not last long, and continued to look with all his eyes and listen with all his ears. He was right. At the end of some seconds, two sharp taps were heard inside. The young woman in the street replied by a single tap, and the shutter was opened a little way. It may be judged whether D'Artagnan looked or listened with avidity. Unfortunately, the light had been removed into another chamber. But the eyes of the young man were accustomed to the night. Besides, the eyes of the Gascons have, as it is asserted, like those of cats, the faculty of seeing in the dark. D'Artagnan then saw that the young woman took from her pocket a white object, which she unfolded quickly, and which took the form of a handkerchief. She made her interlocutor observe the corner of this unfolded object. This immediately recalled to D'Artagnan's mind the handkerchief which he had found at the feet of Madame Bonacieux, which had reminded him of that which he had dragged from under the feet of Aramis. What the devil could that handkerchief signify? Placed where he was, D'Artagnan could not perceive the face of Aramis. We say Aramis, because the young man entertained no doubt that it was his friend who held this dialogue from the interior with the lady of the exterior. Curiosity prevailed over prudence, and profiting by the preoccupation into which the sight of the handkerchief appeared to have plunged the two personages now on the scene, he stole from his hiding-place, and quick as lightning, but stepping with utmost caution, he ran and placed himself close to the angle of the wall, from which his eyes could pierce the interior of Aramis's room. Upon gaining this advantage, D'Artagnan was near uttering a cry of surprise. It was not Aramis who was conversing with the nocturnal visitor. It was a woman. D'Artagnan, however, could only see enough to recognize the form of her vestments, not enough to distinguish her features. At the same instant, the woman inside drew a second handkerchief from her pocket, and exchanged it for that which had just been shown to her. Then some words were spoken by the two women— at length the shutter closed. The woman who was outside the window turned round and passed within four steps of D'Artagnan, pulling down the hood of her mantle. But the precaution was too late. D'Artagnan had already recognized Madame Bonacieux. Madame Bonacieux! The suspicion that it was she had crossed the mind of D'Artagnan when she saw the handkerchief from her pocket. But what probability was there that Madame Bonacieux, who had sent for Monsieur Laporte in order to be reconducted to the Louvre, should be running about the streets of Paris at half-past eleven at night, at the risk of being abducted a second time? This must be, then, an affair of importance. And what is the most important affair to a woman of twenty-five? Love. But was it on her own account, or on account of another, that she exposed herself to such hazards? This was a question the young man asked himself, whom the demon of jealousy already gnawed, being in heart neither more nor less than an accepted lover. There was a very simple means of satisfying himself whether Madame Bonacieux was going. That was to follow her. 
This method was so simple that D'Artagnan employed it quite naturally and instinctively. But at the sight of the young man, who detached himself from the wall like a statue walking from its niche, and at the noise of the steps which she heard resound behind her, Madame Bonacieux uttered a little cry and fled. D'Artagnan ran after her. It was not difficult for him to overtake a woman embarrassed with her cloak. He came up with her before she had traversed a third of the street. The unfortunate woman was exhausted, not by fatigue, but by terror, and when D'Artagnan placed his hand upon her shoulder, she sank upon one knee, crying in a choking voice, "'Kill me, if you please! You shall know nothing!' D'Artagnan raised her by passing his arm round her waist, but as he felt by her weight she was on the point of fainting, he made haste to reassure her by protestations of devotedness. These protestations were nothing for Madame Bonacieux, for such protestations may be made with the worst intentions in the world, but the voice was all. Madame Bonacieux thought she recognized the sound of that voice. She reopened her eyes, cast a quick glance upon the man who had terrified her so, and at once, perceiving it was D'Artagnan, she uttered a cry of joy. "'Oh, it is you! It is you! Thank God! Thank God!' "'Yes, it is I,' said D'Artagnan. It is I, whom God has sent to watch over you. "'Was it with that intention you followed me?' asked the young woman, with a coquettish smile, whose somewhat bantering character resumed its influence, and with whom all fear had disappeared from the moment in which she recognized a friend in one she had taken for an enemy. "'No,' said D'Artagnan. "'No, I confess it. It was chance that threw me in your way. I saw a woman knocking at the window of one of my friends.' "'One of your friends?' interrupted Madame Bonacieux. "'Without doubt, Aramis is one of my best friends.' "'Aramis? Who is he?' "'Come, come, you won't tell me you don't know Aramis. "'This is the first time that I ever heard his name pronounced.' "'It is the first time, then, that you ever went to that house?' "'Undoubtedly.' "'And you did not know that it was inhabited by a young man?' "'No. By a musketeer?' "'No, indeed.' "'It was not he, then, that you came to seek?' "'Not the least in the world. Besides, you must have seen that the person to whom I spoke was a woman.' "'That is true, but this woman is a friend of Aramis. I know nothing of that, since she lodges with him. That does not concern me. But who is she?' "'Oh, that is not my secret.' "'My dear Madame Bonacieux, you are charming, but at the same time you are one of the most mysterious women. "'Do I lose by that?' "'No, you are, on the contrary, adorable. "'Give me your arm, then. "'Most willingly. And now?' "'Now escort me.' "'Where?' "'Where I am going. "'But where are you going?' "'You will see, because you will leave me at the door.' "'Shall I wait for you? "'That will be useless. "'You will return alone, then? "'Perhaps yes, perhaps no. "'But will the person who shall accompany you afterward "'be a man or a woman? "'I don't know yet. "'But I will know it. "'How so? "'I will wait until you come out. "'In that case, adieu. "'Why so? "'I do not want you. "'But you have claimed... The aid of a gentleman, not the watchfulness of a spy. The word is rather hard. How are they called who follow others in spite of them? They are indiscreet. The word is too mild. Well, madame, I perceive I must do as you wish. Why did you deprive yourself of the merit of doing so at once? Is there no merit in repentance? And do you really repent? I know nothing about it myself, but what I know is that I promise to do all that you wish if you allow me to accompany you where you are going. And you will leave me then? Yes. Without waiting for my coming out again? Yes. Word of honor? By the faith of a gentleman. Take my arm and let us go. D'Artagnan offered his arm to Madame Bonacieux, who willingly took it, half laughing, half trembling, and both gained the top of the Rue de la Harpe. Arriving there, the young woman seemed to hesitate, as she had done before in the Rue Vaugirard. She seemed, however, by certain signs, to recognize a door, and approaching that door, "'And now, monsieur,' said she, 
it is here i have business a thousand thanks for your honourable company which has saved me from all the dangers to which alone i was exposed but that moment is come to keep your word i have reached my destination and you will have nothing to fear on your return i shall have nothing to fear but robbers and that is nothing what could they take from me i have not a penny about me you forget that beautiful handkerchief with the coat of arms which that which i found at your feet and replaced in your pocket hold your tongue imprudent man do you wish to destroy me you see very plainly that there is still danger for you since a single word makes you tremble and you confess that if that word were heard you would be ruined come come madame cried d'artagnan seizing her hands and surveying her with an ardent glance come be more generous confide in me have you not read in my eyes that there is nothing but devotion and sympathy in my heart yes replied madame bonacieux therefore ask my own secrets and i will reveal them to you but those of others that is quite another thing very well said d'artagnan i shall discover them as these secrets may have an influence over your life these secrets must become mine beware of what you do cried the young woman in a manner so serious as to make d'artagnan start in spite of himself oh meddle in nothing which concerns me do not seek to assist me in that matter which i am accomplishing this i ask of you in the name of the interest with which i inspire you in the name of the service you have rendered me and which i shall never forget while i have life rather place faith in what i tell you have no more concern about me i exist no longer for you any more than if you had never seen me must aramis do as much as i madame said d'artagnan deeply piqued this is the second or third time monsieur that you have repeated that name and yet i have told you that i do not know him you do not know the man at whose shutter you have just knocked indeed madame you believe me too credulous confess that it is for the sake of making me talk that you invent this story and create this personage i invent nothing madame i create nothing i only speak the exact truth and you say that one of your friends lives in that house i say so and i repeat it for the third time that house is one inhabited by my friend and that friend is aramis all this will be cleared up at a later period murmured the young woman no monsieur be silent if you could see my heart said d'artagnan you would there read so much curiosity that you would pity me and so much love that you would instantly satisfy my curiosity we have nothing to fear from those who love us you speak very suddenly of love said the young woman shaking her head that is because love has come suddenly upon me and for the first time and because i am only twenty the young woman looked at him furtively listen i am already upon the scent resumed d'artagnan about three months ago i was near having a duel with aramis concerning a handkerchief resembling the one you showed to the woman in his house for a handkerchief marked in the same manner i am sure monsieur said the young woman you weary me very much i assure you with your questions but you madame prudent as you are think if you were to be arrested with that handkerchief and that handkerchief were to be seized would you not be compromised in what way the initials are only mine c b constance bonacieux or camille de bois tracy silence monsieur once again silence ah oh, since the dangers i incur on my own account cannot stop you think of those you may yourself run me yes there is peril of imprisonment risk of life in knowing me then i will not leave you monsieur said the young woman supplicating him and clasping her hands together monsieur in the name of heaven by the honour of a soldier by the courtesy of a gentleman depart there there midnight sounds that is the hour when i am expected madame said the young man bowing i can refuse nothing asked of me thus be content i will depart but you will not follow me you will not watch me i will return home instantly ah i was quite sure you were a good and brave young man said madame bonacieux holding out her hand to him 
and placing the other upon the knocker of a little door almost hidden in the wall. D'Artagnan seized the hand held out to him, and kissed it ardently. "'Ah! I wish I had never seen you!' cried D'Artagnan, with that ingenuous roughness which women often prefer to the affectations of politeness, because it betrays the depths of the thought, and proves that feeling prevails over reason." "'Well,' resumed Madame Bonacieux, in a voice almost caressing, and pressing the hand of D'Artagnan, who had not relinquished hers, "'Well, I will not say as much as you do. What is lost for to-day may not be lost for ever. Who knows when I shall be at liberty that I may not satisfy your curiosity?' "'And will you make the same promise to my love?' cried D'Artagnan, beside himself with joy. "'Oh, as to that, I do not engage myself.' That depends upon the sentiments with which you may inspire me. Then to-day, madame— Oh, to-day, I am no further than gratitude. Ah, you are too charming, said D'Artagnan sorrowfully, and you abuse my love. No, I use your generosity, that's all. But be of good cheer. With certain people everything comes round. Oh, you render me the happiest of men. Do not forget this evening— do not forget that promise. Be satisfied. In the proper time and place I will remember everything. Now then, go. Go, in the name of heaven. I was expected at sharp midnight, and I am late. By five minutes. Yes, but in certain circumstances five minutes are five ages. When one loves. Well, and who told you I had no affair with a lover? "'It is a man, then, who expects you?' cried D'Artagnan. "'A man?' "'The discussion is going to begin again,' said Madame Bonacieux, with a half-smile, which was not exempt from a tinge of impatience. "'No, no, I go, I depart. I believe in you, and I would have all the merit of my devotion, even if that devotion were stupidity. Adieu, madame, adieu.' and as if he only felt strength to detach himself by a violent effort from the hand he held, he sprang away, running, while Madame Bonacieux knocked, as at the shutter, three light and regular taps. When he had gained the angle of the street, he turned. The door had been opened and shut again. The mercer's pretty wife had disappeared. D'Artagnan pursued his way. He had given his word not to watch Madame Bonacieux, and if his life had depended upon the spot to which she was going, or upon the person who should accompany her, D'Artagnan would have returned home, since he had so promised. Five minutes later he was in the Rue de Fossoyeurs. "'Poor Athos,' said he, "'he will never guess what all this means. He will have fallen asleep waiting for me, or else he will have returned home, where he will have learned that a woman had been there. A woman with Athos! After all,' continued D'Artagnan, "'there was certainly one with Aramis.' All this is very strange, and I am curious to know how it will end. "'Badly, monsieur, badly,' replied a voice, which the young man recognized as that of Planchet, for, soliloquizing aloud, as very preoccupied people do, he had entered the alley, at the end of which were the stairs which led to his chamber. "'How badly? What do you mean by that, you idiot?' asked D'Artagnan. "'What has happened?' "'All sorts of misfortunes.' "'What?' "'In the first place, Monsieur Athos is arrested.' "'Arrested? Athos arrested? What for?' "'He was found in your lodging. They took him for you.' "'And by whom was he arrested?' "'By guards brought by the men in black whom you put to flight.' "'Why did he not tell them his name? Why did he not tell them he knew nothing about this affair?' "'He took care not to do so, monsieur. On the contrary, he came up to me and said—' It is your master that needs his liberty at this moment, and not I, since he knows everything and I know nothing. They will believe he is arrested, and that will give him time. In three days I will tell them who I am, and they cannot fail to let me go. Brave Athos, noble heart, murmured D'Artagnan. I know him well there. And what did the officers do? Four conveyed him away, I don't know where, to the Bastille or Fort Levesque. Two remained with the men in black who rummaged every place and took all the papers. The last two mounted guard at the door during this examination. Then, when all was over, they went away, leaving the house empty and exposed. And Porthos and Aramis? I could not find them. They did not come. 
"'But they may come any moment, for you left word that I awaited them.' "'Yes, monsieur.' "'Well, don't budge, then. If they come, tell them what has happened. Let them wait for me at the Pomme de Pin. Here it would be dangerous. The house may be watched. I will run to Monsieur de Treville to tell them all this, and will meet them there.' "'Very well, monsieur,' said Planchet. "'But you will remain. You are not afraid,' said D'Artagnan, coming back to recommend courage to his lackey. "'Be easy, monsieur,' said Planchet. "'You do not know me yet. I am brave when I set about it. It is all in beginning. Besides, I am a Picard.' "'Then it is understood,' said D'Artagnan. "'You would rather be killed than desert your post?' "'Yes, monsieur, and there is nothing I would not do to prove to monsieur that I am attached to him.' "'Good,' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'It appears that the method I have adopted with this boy is decidedly the best.' I shall use it again upon occasion. And with all the swiftness of his legs, already a little fatigued, however, with the perambulations of the day, D'Artagnan directed his course toward M. de Treville's. M. de Treville was not at his hotel. His company was on guard at the Louvre. He was at the Louvre with his company. It was necessary to reach M. de Treville. It was important that he should be informed of what was passing. D'Artagnan resolved to try and enter the Louvre. His costume of guardsman in the company of Monsieur de Cessart ought to be his passport. He therefore went down the Rue de Petit Augustine and came up to the quay in order to take the new bridge. He had at first an idea of crossing by the ferry, but on gaining the riverside he had mechanically put his hand into his pocket and perceived that he had not wherewithal to pay his passage. As he gained the top of the Rue Guenegarde, he saw two persons coming out of the Rue Dauphine, whose appearance very much struck him. Of the two persons who composed this group, one was a man and the other a woman. The woman had the outline of Madame Bonacieux. The man resembled Aramis, so much as to be mistaken for him. Besides, the woman wore that black mantle which D'Artagnan could still see outlined on the shutter of the Rue de Vaugirard and on the door of the Rue de la Harpe. Still further, the man wore the uniform of a musketeer. The woman's hood was pulled down, and the man held a handkerchief to his face. Both, as this double precaution indicated, had an interest in not being recognized. They took the bridge. That was D'Artagnan's road, as he was going to the Louvre. D'Artagnan followed them. He had not gone twenty steps before he became convinced that the woman really was Madame Bonacieux, and that the man was Aramis. He felt, at that instant, all the suspicions of jealousy agitating his heart. He felt himself doubly betrayed by his friend, and by her whom he already loved like a mistress. Madame Bonacieux had declared to him, by all the gods, that she did not know Aramis, and a quarter of an hour after having made this assertion he found her hanging on the arm of Aramis. D'Artagnan did not reflect that he had only known the mercer's pretty wife for three hours, that she owed him nothing but a little gratitude for having delivered her from the men in black, who wished to carry her off, and that she had promised him nothing— he considered himself an outraged, betrayed, and ridiculed lover. Blood and anger mounted to his face. He was resolved to unravel the mystery. The young man and young woman perceived they were watched, and redoubled their speed. D'Artagnan determined upon his course. He passed them, then returned so as to meet them exactly before the Samaritan, which was illuminated by a lamp which threw its light all over that part of the bridge. D'Artagnan stopped before them, and they stopped before him. "'What do you want, monsieur?' demanded the musketeer, recoiling a step, and with a foreign accent, which proved to D'Artagnan that he was deceived in one of his conjectures. "'It is not Aramis,' cried he. "'No, monsieur, it is not Aramis, and by your exclamation I perceive you have mistaken me for another, and pardon you.' "'You pardon me?' cried D'Artagnan. "'Yes,' replied the stranger. "'Allow me, then, to pass on, since it is not with me you have anything to do.' "'You are right, monsieur. It is not with you that I have anything to do. It is with madame.' "'With madame? You do not know her,' replied the stranger. "'You are deceived, monsieur. I know her very well.' "'Ah,' said madame Bonacieux, in a tone of reproach, "'ah, monsieur, I had your promise as a soldier and your word as a gentleman. I hoped to be able to rely upon that.' "'And I, madame,' said D'Artagnan, embarrassed, "'you promised me.' 
"'Take my arm, madame,' said the stranger, "'and let us continue our way.' D'Artagnan, however, stupefied, cast down, annihilated by all that happened, stood, with crossed arms, before the musketeer and Madame Bonacieux. The musketeer advanced two steps, and pushed D'Artagnan aside with his hand. D'Artagnan made a spring backward, and drew his sword. At the same time, with the rapidity of lightning, the stranger drew his. "'In the name of heaven, my lord!' cried Madame Bonacieux, throwing herself between the combatants and seizing the swords with her hands. "'My lord!' cried D'Artagnan, enlightened by a sudden idea. "'My lord! Pardon me, monsieur, but you are not—' "'My lord, the Duke of Buckingham,' said Madame Bonacieux in an undertone, "'and now you may ruin us all.' "'My lord, madame, I ask a hundred pardons. "'But I love her, my lord, and was jealous. "'You know what it is to love, my lord. "'Pardon me, and then tell me how I can risk my life to serve your grace.' "'You are a brave young man,' said Buckingham, holding out his hand to D'Artagnan, who pressed it respectfully. "'You offer me your services. With the same frankness, I accept them. "'Follow us at a distance of twenty paces, as far as the Louvre, and if anyone watches us, slay him.' D'Artagnan placed his naked sword under his arm, allowed the Duke and Madame Bonacieux to take twenty steps ahead, and then followed them, ready to execute the instructions of the noble and elegant minister of Charles I. Fortunately, he had no opportunity to give the duke this proof of his devotion, and the young woman and the handsome musketeer entered the Louvre by the wicket of the Echelle without any interference. As for D'Artagnan, he immediately repaired to the cabaret of the Pomme du Pin, where he found Porthos and Aramis awaiting him. Without giving them any explanation of the alarm and inconvenience he had caused them, he told them that he had terminated the affair alone in which he had for a moment believed he should need their assistance. Meanwhile, carried away as we are by our narrative, we must leave our three friends to themselves, and follow the Duke of Buckingham and his guide through the labyrinths of the Louvre. End of chapter 11「George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham」Mademoiselle Bonacieux and the Duke entered the Louvre without difficulty. Mademoiselle Bonacieux was known to belong to the Queen. The Duke wore the uniform of the musketeers of Monsieur de Treville, who, as we have said, were that evening on guard. Besides, Germain was in the interests of the Queen, and if anything should happen, Mademoiselle Bonacieux would be accused of having introduced her lover into the Louvre, that was all. She took the risk upon herself. Her reputation would be lost, it is true, but of what value in the world was the reputation of the little wife of a mercer? Once within the interior of the court, the duke and the young woman followed the wall for the space of about twenty-five steps. This space passed, Mademoiselle Bonacieux pushed a little servant's door, open by day, but generally closed at night. The door yielded. Both entered, and found themselves in darkness. But Mademoiselle Bonacieux was acquainted with all the turnings and windings of this part of the Louvre, appropriated for the people of the household. She closed the door after her, took the Duke by the hand, and after a few experimental steps, grasped a balustrade, put her foot upon the bottom step, and began to ascend the staircase. The Duke counted two stories. She then turned to the right, followed the course of a long corridor, descended a flight, went a few steps farther, introduced a key into a lock, opened a door, and pushed the duke into an apartment lighted only by a lamp, saying, "'Remain here, my lord duke. Someone will come.' She then went out by the same door, which she locked, so that the duke found himself literally a prisoner. Nevertheless, isolated as he was, we must say that the Duke of Buckingham did not experience an instant of fear. One of the salient points of his character was the search for adventures and a love of romance. Brave, rash, and enterprising, this was not the first time he had risked his life in such attempts. He had learned that the pretended message from Anne of Austria, upon the faith of which he had come to Paris, was a snare. But instead of regaining England, he had, abusing the position in which he had been placed, declared to the Queen that he would not depart without seeing her. 
the queen had at first positively refused, but at length became afraid that the duke, if exasperated, would commit some folly. She had already decided upon seeing him, and urging his immediate departure, when, on the very evening of coming to this decision, Mademoiselle Bonacieux, who was charged with going to fetch the duke and conducting him to the Louvre, was abducted. For two days no one knew what had become of her, and everything remained in suspense. But once free, and placed in communication with Laporte, matters resumed their course, and she accomplished the perilous enterprise which, but for her arrest, would have been executed three days earlier. Buckingham, left alone, walked toward a mirror. His musketeer's uniform became him marvellously. At thirty-five, which was then his age, he passed, with just title, for the handsomest gentleman and the most elegant cavalier of France or England. The favourite of two kings, immensely rich, all-powerful in the kingdom which he disordered at his fancy and calmed again at his caprice, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, had lived one of those fabulous existences which survive in the course of centuries to astonish posterity. Sure of himself, convinced of his own power, certain that the laws which rule other men could not reach him, he went straight to the object he aimed at, even where this object were so elevated and so dazzling that it would have been madness for any other man to have contemplated it. It was thus he had succeeded in approaching several times the beautiful and proud Anne of Austria, and in making himself loved by dazzling her. George Villiers placed himself before the glass, as we have said, restored the undulations to his beautiful hair, which the weight of his hat had disordered, twisted his moustache, and, his heart swelling with joy, happy and proud at being near the moment he had so long sighed for, he smiled upon himself with pride and hope. At this moment a door concealed in the tapestry opened, and a woman appeared. Buckingham saw this apparition in the glass. He uttered a cry. It was the Queen! Anne of Austria was then twenty-six or twenty-seven years of age. That is to say, she was in the full splendour of her beauty. Her carriage was that of a queen or a goddess. Her eyes, which cast the brilliancy of emeralds, were perfectly beautiful, and yet were at the same time full of sweetness and majesty. Her mouth was small and rosy, and although her underlip, like that of all princes of the House of Austria, protruded slightly beyond the other, it was eminently lovely in its smile, but as profoundly disdainful in its contempt. Her skin was admired for its velvety softness. Her hands and arms were of surpassing beauty, all the poets of the time singing them as incomparable. Lastly, her hair, which, from being light in her youth, had become chestnut, and which she wore curled very plainly and with much powder, admirably set off her face, in which the most rigid critic could only have desired a little less rouge, and the most fastidious sculptor a little more fineness in the nose. Buckingham remained for a moment dazzled. Never had Anna of Austria appeared to him so beautiful amid balls, fetes, or carousels, as she appeared to him at this moment, dressed in a simple robe of white satin, and accompanied by Donna Estefania, the only one of her Spanish women who had not been driven from her by the jealousy of the king or by the persecutions of Richelieu. Anne of Austria took two steps forward. Buckingham threw himself at her feet, and before the queen could prevent him, kissed the hem of her robe. Duke, you already know that it is not I who caused you to be written to. Yes, yes, madame, yes, your majesty, cried the duke. I know that I must have been mad, senseless, to believe that snow would become animated or marble warm. But what then? They who love believe easily in love. Besides, I have lost nothing by this journey because I see you. Yes, replied Anne, but you know why? and how I see you, because, insensible to all my sufferings, you persist in remaining in a city where, 
by remaining you run the risk of your life and make me run the risk of my honour i see you to tell you that everything separates us the depths of the sea the enmity of kingdoms the sanctity of vows it is sacrilege to struggle against so many things my lord in short i see you to tell you that we must never see each other again speak on madam speak on queen said buckingham the sweetness of your voice covers the harshness of your words you talk of sacrilege why the sacrilege is the separation of two hearts formed by god for each other my lord cried the queen you forget that i have never said that i love you but you have never told me that you did not love me and truly to speak such words to me would be on the part of your majesty too great an ingratitude for tell me where can you find a love like mine a love which neither time nor absence nor despair can extinguish a love which contents itself with a lost ribbon a stray look or a chance word it is now three years madame since i saw you for the first time and during those three years i have loved you thus shall i tell you each ornament of your toilet mark i see you now you were seated upon cushions in the spanish fashion you wore a robe of green satin embroidered with gold and silver hanging sleeves knotted upon your beautiful arms those lovely arms with large diamonds you wore a close ruff a small cap upon your head of the same color as your robe and in that cap a heron's feather hold hold i shut my eyes and i can see you as you were then i open them again and i see what you are now a hundred times more beautiful what folly murmured anne of austria who had not the courage to find fault with the duke for having so well preserved her portrait in his heart what folly to feed a useless passion with such remembrances and upon what then must i live i have nothing but memory it is my happiness my treasure my hope every time i see you is a fresh diamond which i enclose in the casket of my heart this is the fourth which you have let fall and i have picked up for in three years madame i have only seen you four times the first which i have described to you the second at the mansion of madame de chevreuse the third in the gardens of amiens duke said the queen blushing never speak of that evening oh let us speak of it on the contrary let us speak of it that is the most happy and brilliant evening of my life you remember what a beautiful night it was how soft and perfumed was the air how lovely the blue heavens and star enameled sky ah then madame i was able for one instant to be alone with you then you were about to tell me all the isolation of your life the griefs of your heart you leaned upon my arm upon this madame i felt in bending my head toward you your beautiful hair touched my cheek and every time that it touched me i trembled from head to foot oh queen queen you, you do not know what felicity from heaven what joys from paradise are comprised in a moment like that take my wealth my fortune my glory all the days i have to live for such an instant for a night like that for that night madame that night you love me i will swear it my lord yes it is possible that the influence of the place the charm of the beautiful evening the fascination of your look the thousand circumstances in short which sometimes unite to destroy a woman were grouped around me on that fatal evening but my lord you saw the queen come to the aid of the woman who faltered at the first word you dared to utter at the first freedom to which i had to reply i called for help yes yes that is true 
and any other love but mine would have sunk beneath this ordeal. But my love came out from it more ardent and more eternal. You believed that you would fly from me by returning to Paris. You believed that I would not dare to quit the treasure over which my master had charged me to watch. What to me were all the treasures in the world, or all the kings of the earth? Eight days after I was back again, madame. That time you had nothing to say to me. I had risked my life in favour to see you, but for a second. I did not even touch your hand, and you pardoned me on seeing me so submissive and so repentant. Yes, but calumny seized upon all those follies in which I took no part, as you know well, my lord. The king, excited by the cardinal, made a terrible clamour. Madame de Vernet was driven from me. Putange was exiled. Madame de Chevreuse fell into disgrace, and when you wished to come back as ambassador to France, the king himself, remember, my lord, the king himself opposed to it. Yes, and France is about to pay for her king's refusal, with the war. I am not allowed to see you, madame, but you shall every day hear of me. What object, think you, have this expedition to Ray, and this league with the Protestants of La Rochelle, which I am projecting? The pleasure of seeing you. I have no hope of penetrating, sword in hand, to Paris, I know that well. But this war may bring round a peace. This peace will require a negotiator. That negotiator will be me. They will not dare to refuse me then, and I will return to Paris and will see you again, and will be happy for an instant. Thousands of men, it is true, will have to pay for my happiness with their lives, but what is that to me? Provided I see you again. All this is perhaps folly, perhaps insanity, but tell me, what woman has a lover more truly in love? What queen, a servant more ardent? My lord, my lord! You invoke in your defence things which accuse you more strongly. All these proofs of love which you would give me are almost crimes. Because you do not love me, madame. If you love me, you would view all this otherwise. If you love me, if you love me, that would be too great of happiness, and I should run mad. Ah, madame de Chevreuse was less cruel than you. Holland loved her and she responded to his love. Madame de Chevreuse was not queen, murmured Anne of Austria, overcome in spite of herself by the expression of so profound a passion. You would love me, then, if you were not queen. Madame, say that you would love me then. I can believe that it is the dignity of your rank alone which makes you cruel to me. I can believe that, had you been Madame de Chevreuse, Poor Buckingham might have hoped. Thanks for those sweet words. Oh, my beautiful sovereign, a hundred times thanks. Oh, my lord, you have ill understood, wrongly interpreted. I did not mean to say— Silence, silence, cried the duke. If I am happy in an error, do not have the cruelty to lift me from it. You have told me yourself, madame, that I have been drawn into a snare. I perhaps may leave my life in it, although it may be strange. I have for some time had a presentiment that I should shortly die. And the Duke smiled, with a smile at once sad and charming. "'Oh, my God!' cried Anne of Austria, with an accent of terror, which proved how much greater an interest she took in the Duke than she ventured to tell. "'I do not tell you this, madame, to terrify you. No, it is even ridiculous for me to name it to you. And believe me, I take no heed of such dreams.' But the words you have just spoken, the hope you have almost given me, will have richly paid all, were it my life. Oh, but I, said Anne, I also, Duke, have had presentiments. I also have had dreams. I dream, I dream that I saw you lying bleeding, wounded. In the left side, was it not, and with a knife, interrupted Buckingham. Yes, it was so, my lord, it was so, in the left side, and with a knife. 
who can possibly have told you I had that dream? I have imparted it to no one but my God, and that in my prayers. I ask for no more. You love me, madame. It is enough. I love you? I? Yes, yes, would God said the same dreams to you as to me if you did not love me? Should we have the same presentiments if our existences did not touch at the heart? You love me, my beautiful queen, and you will weep for me? Oh, my God, my God, cried Anne of Austria, this is more than I can bear. In the name of heaven, duke, leave me, go. I do not know whether I love you or love you not. But what I know is that I will not be perjured. Take pity on me, then, and go. Oh, if you are struck in France, if you die in France, if I could imagine that your love for me was the cause of your death, I could not console myself. I should run mad. Depart, then. Depart, I implore you. Oh, how beautiful you are thus! Oh, how I love you! said Buckingham. Go! Go, I implore you, and return hereafter. Come back as ambassador. Come back as minister. Come back surrounded with guards who will defend you, with servants who will watch over you. And then I shall no longer fear for your days, and I shall be happy in seeing you. Oh, is this true what you say? Yes. Oh, then some pledge of your indulgence, some object which came from you and may remind me that I have not been dreaming. Something you have worn, and that I may wear in my turn. A ring, a necklace, a chain. Will you depart if I give you your demand? Yes. This very instant? Yes. You will leave France? You will return to England? I will. I swear to you. Wait, then. Wait. Anne of Austria re-entered her apartment and came out again almost immediately, holding a rosewood casket in her hand, with her cipher encrusted with gold. "'Here, my lord, here,' said she, "'keep this in memory of me.' Buckingham took the casket, and fell a second time on his knees. "'You have promised me to go,' said the Queen. "'And I keep my word. Your hand, madame, your hand, and I depart.' Anne of Austria stretched forth her hand, closing her eyes, and leaning with the other upon Estefania, for she felt that her strength was about to fail her. Buckingham pressed his lips passionately to that beautiful hand, and then, rising, said, Within six months, if I am not dead, I shall have seen you again, madame, even if I have to overturn the world. And faithful to the promise he had made, he rushed out of the apartment. In the corridor he met Mademoiselle Bonacieux, who waited for him, and who, with the same precautions and the same good luck, conducted him out of the Louvre. End of chapter Chapter 13 Monsieur Bonacieux There was in all this, as may have been observed, one personage concerned of whom notwithstanding his precarious position, we have appeared to take but very little notice. This personage was M. Bonacieux, the respectable martyr of the political and amorous intrigues which entangled themselves so nicely together at this gallant and chivalric period. Fortunately, the reader may remember, or may not remember, we have promised not to lose sight of him. The officers who arrested him conducted him straight to the Bastille, where he passed trembling before a party of soldiers who were loading their muskets. Thence, introduced into a half-subterranean gallery, he became, on the part of those who had brought him, the object of the grossest insults and the harshest treatment. The officers perceived that they had not to deal with a gentleman, and they treated him like a very peasant. At the end of half an hour or thereabouts, a clerk came to put an end to his tortures, but not to his anxiety, by giving the order to conduct M. Bonacieux to the chamber of examination. Ordinarily, prisoners were interrogated in their cells, but they did not do so with M. Bonacieux. Two guards attended the mercer, who made him traverse a court and enter a corridor, in which there were three sentinels, 
opened a door and pushed him unceremoniously into a low room, where the only furniture was a table, a chair, and a commissary. The commissary was seated in the chair, and was writing at the table. The two guards led the prisoner toward the table, and upon a sign from the commissary drew back so far as to be unable to hear anything. The commissary, who had till this time held his head down over his papers, looked up to see what sort of person he had to do with. This commissary was a man of very repulsive mien, with a pointed nose, with yellow and salient cheekbones, with eyes small but keen and penetrating, and an expression of countenance resembling at once the polecat and the fox. His head, supported by a long and flexible neck, issued from his large black robe, balancing itself with a motion very much like that of the tortoise thrusting his head out of his shell. He began by asking M. Bonacieux his name, age, condition, and abode. The accused replied that his name was Jacques Michel Bonacieux, that he was fifty-one years old, a retired mercer, and lived at Rue de Fossoyeur, numero quatorze. The commissary then, instead of continuing to interrogate him, made a long speech upon the danger there is for an obscure citizen to meddle with public matters. He complicated this exordium by an exposition in which he painted the power and the deeds of the cardinal, that incomparable minister, that conqueror of past ministers, that example for ministers to come, deeds and power which none could thwart with impunity. After this second part of his discourse, fixing his hawk's eye upon poor Bonacieux, he bade him reflect upon the gravity of his situation. The reflections of the mercer were already made. He cursed the instant with M. Laporte formed the idea of marrying him to his goddaughter, and particularly the moment when that goddaughter had been received as Lady of the Linen to Her Majesty. At bottom, the character of M. Bonacieux was one of profound selfishness, mixed with sordid avarice, the whole seasoned with extreme cowardice. The love with which his young wife had inspired him was a secondary sentiment, and was not strong enough to contend with the primitive feelings we have just enumerated. Bonacieux, indeed, reflected upon what had just been said to him. "'But, Monsieur Commissary, said he calmly, believe that I know and appreciate, more than anybody, the merit of the incomparable eminence by whom we have the honour to be governed. Indeed, asked the commissary, with an air of doubt, if that is really so, how came you to the Bastille? How came I there, or rather why I am there, replied Bonacieux. That is entirely impossible for me to tell you, because I don't know myself but to a certainty it is not for having, knowingly at least, disobliged Monsieur de Cardinal. You must, nevertheless, have committed a crime, since you are here and are accused of high treason. Of high treason! cried Bonacieux, terrified. Of high treason! How is it possible for a poor mercer, who detests Huguenots and who abhors Spaniards, to be accused of high treason? Consider, monsieur, the thing is absolutely impossible. Monsieur Bonacieux, said the commissary, looking at the accused as if his little eyes had the faculty of reading to the very depths of hearts, you have a wife? Yes, monsieur, replied the mercer in a tremble, feeling that it was at this point affairs were likely to become perplexing. That is to say, I had one. What? You had one? What have you done with her, then, if you have her no longer? They have abducted her, monsieur. They have abducted her? Ha! Bonacieux inferred from this ah that the affair grew more and more intricate. They have abducted her, added the commissary. And do you know the man who has committed this deed? I think I know him. Who is he? Remember that I affirm nothing, Monsieur de Commissary, and that I only suspect. Whom do you suspect? Come, answer freely. 
M. Bonacieux was in the greatest perplexity possible. Had he better deny everything, or tell everything? By denying all, it might be suspected that he must know too much to avow. By confessing all, he might prove his good will. He decided, then, to tell all. "'I suspect,' said he, "'a tall, dark man, of lofty carriage, who has the air of a great lord. He has followed us several times, I think, when I have waited for my wife at the wicket of the Louvre to escort her home.' The commissary now appeared to experience a little uneasiness. "'And his name?' said he. Oh, as to his name, I know nothing about it. But if I were ever to meet him, I should recognize him in an instant. I will answer for it, were he among a thousand persons. The face of the commissary grew still darker. You should recognize him among a thousand, say you, continued he. That is to say, cried Bonacio, who saw he had taken a false step, that is to say, you have answered that you should recognize him, said the commissary. That is all very well, and enough for to-day. Before we proceed further, someone must be informed that you know the ravisher of your wife. But I have told you I don't know him, cried Bonacio in despair. I have told you, on the contrary. Take away the prisoner, said the commissary to the two guards. Where must we place him? demanded the chief. In a dungeon. Which? Good Lord, in the first one handy, provided it is safe said the commissary, with an indifference which penetrated poor Bonacio with horror. "'Alas! alas!' said he to himself. "'Misfortune is over my head. My wife must have committed some frightful crime. They believe me her accomplice, and will punish me with her. She must have spoken. She must have confessed everything. A woman is so weak. A dungeon! The first he comes to. That's it.' My night is soon past, and to-morrow to the wheel, to the gallows. Oh, my God, my God, have pity on me! Without listening the least in the world to the lamentations of Monsieur Bonacieux, lamentations to which, besides, they must have been pretty well accustomed, the two guards took the prisoner each by an arm, and led him away, while the commissary wrote a letter in haste and dispatched it by an officer in waiting. Bonacieux could not close his eyes not because his dungeon was so very disagreeable, but because his uneasiness was so great. He sat all night on his stool, starting at the least noise, and when the first rays of the sun penetrated into his chamber, the dawn itself appeared to him to have taken funereal tints. All at once he heard his bolts drawn, and made a terrified bound. He believed they were come to conduct him to the scaffold, so that when he saw merely and simply, instead of the executioner he expected, only his commissary of the preceding evening, attended by his clerk, he was ready to embrace them both. "'Your affair has become more complicated since yesterday evening, my good man, and I advise you to tell the whole truth, for your repentance alone can remove the anger of the cardinal.' "'Why, I—' I am ready to tell everything, cried Bonacio. At least all that I know. Interrogate me, I entreat you. Where is your wife, in the first place? Why, did I not tell you she'd been stolen from me? Yes, but yesterday at five o'clock in the afternoon, thanks to you, she escaped. My wife escaped, cried Bonacio. Oh, unfortunate creature! Monsieur! If she has escaped, it is not my fault, I swear. What business had you, then, to go into the chamber of Monsieur d'Artagnan, your neighbor, with whom you had a long conference during the day? Ah, yes, Monsieur Commissary, yes, that is true, and, and I confess I was in the wrong. I did go to Monsieur d'Artagnan's. What was the aim of that visit? To beg him to assist me in finding my wife. I believed I had a right to endeavour to find her. I was deceived, as it appears, and I ask your pardon. And what did Monsieur d'Artagnan reply? Monsieur d'Artagnan uh, promised me his assistance, but I soon found out that he was betraying me. You impose upon justice, 
Monsieur d'Artagnan made a compact with you, and in virtue of that compact put to flight the police who had arrested your wife, and has placed her beyond reach. Fortunately, Monsieur d'Artagnan is in our hands, and you shall be confronted with him. By my faith, I ask no better, cried Bonacieux. I shall not be sorry to see the face of an acquaintance. Bring in the Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the commissary to the guards. The two guards led in Athos. Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the commissary, addressing Athos, declare all that has passed yesterday between you and Monsieur. But, cried Bonacieux, this is not Monsieur d'Artagnan who you show me. What? Not Monsieur d'Artagnan? exclaimed the commissary. Not the least in the world, replied Bonacieux. What is this gentleman's name? asked the commissary. I cannot tell you. I don't know him. How? You don't know him? No. Did you never see him? Y yes, I have seen him, but I don't know what he calls himself. Your name, replied the commissary. Athos, replied the musketeer. But that is not a man's name. It is the name of a mountain, cried the poor questioner, who was beginning to lose his head. That is my name, said Athos quietly. But you said that your name was D'Artagnan. Who? I? Yes, you. Somebody said to me, You are Monsieur D'Artagnan? I answered, You think so? My guards exclaimed that they were sure of it. I did not wish to contradict them. Besides, I might be deceived. Monsieur, you insult the majesty of justice. Not at all, said Athos calmly. You are Monsieur d'Artagnan. You see, monsieur, that you say it again. But I tell you, monsieur commissary, cried Bonacieux in his turn, there is not the least doubt about the matter. Monsieur d'Artagnan is my tenant, although he does not pay me my rent, and even better on that account ought I know him. Monsieur d'Artagnan is a young man, scarcely nineteen or twenty, and this this gentleman must be thirty at least. Monsieur d'Artagnan is in Monsieur Dessessart's guards, and this gentleman is in the company of Monsieur de Treville's musketeers. Look at his uniform, Monsieur Commissary, look at his uniform. That's true, murmured the commissary. Pardieu, that's true. At this moment the door was opened quickly and a messenger, introduced by one of the gatekeepers of the Bastille, gave a letter to the commissary. "'Oh, unhappy woman!' cried the commissary. "'How? What do you say? Of whom do you speak? It is not my wife, I hope.' "'On the contrary, it is of her. Yours is a pretty business.' "'But,' said the agitated mercer, do me the pleasure, monsieur, to tell me how my own proper affair can become worse by anything my wife does while I am in prison? Because that which she does is part of a plan concerted between you, of an infernal plan. I swear to you, monsieur commissary, that you are in the profoundest error, that I know nothing in the world about what my wife had to do, that I am entirely a stranger to what she has done, and that if she has committed any follies I renounce her, I abjure her, I curse her. Bah, said Athos to the commissary. If you have no more need of me, send me somewhere. Your Monsieur Bonacio is very tiresome. The commissary, designated by the same gesture Athos and Bonacio, let them be guarded more closely than ever. And yet, said Athos, with his habitual calmness, if it is Monsieur d'Artagnan who is concerned in this matter, I do not perceive how I can take his place. Do as I bade you, cried the commissary, and preserve absolute secrecy. You understand. Athos shrugged his shoulders, and followed his guard silently, while Monsieur Bonacieux uttered lamentations enough to break the heart of a tiger. They locked the mercer in the same dungeon where he had passed the night, and left him to himself during the day. Bonacieux wept all day, like a true mercer, not being at all a military man, as he himself informed us. In the evening, about nine o'clock, at the moment he had made up his mind to go to bed, he heard steps in his corridor. These steps drew near to his dungeon, the door was thrown open, 
and the guards appeared. "'Follow me,' said an officer, who came up behind the guards. "'Follow you?' cried Bonacio. "'Follow you at this hour? Where, my God?' "'Where we have orders to lead you.' "'But that is not an answer.' "'It is, nevertheless, the only one we can give.' "'Ah, my God, my God!' murmured the poor mercer. "'Now, indeed, I am lost.' And he followed the guards who came for him, mechanically, and without resistance. He passed along the same corridor as before, crossed one court, then a second side of a building. At length, at the gate of the entrance court, he found a carriage surrounded by four guards on horseback. They made him enter this carriage. The officer placed himself by his side. The door was locked, and they were left in a rolling prison. The carriage was put in motion as slowly as a funeral car. Through the closely fastened windows the prisoner could perceive the houses and the pavement, that was all. But, true Parisian as he was, Bonacio could recognize every street by the milestones, the signs, and the lamps. At the moment of arriving at St. Paul, the spot where such as were condemned at the Bastille were executed, he was near fainting and crossed himself twice. He thought the carriage was about to stop there. The carriage, however, passed on. Farther on, a still greater terror seized him on passing by the cemetery of Saint-Jean, where state criminals were buried. One thing, however, reassured him. He remembered that before they were buried their heads were generally cut off, and he felt that his head was still on his shoulders. But when he saw the carriage take the way to La Greve, where he perceived the pointed roof of the Hôtel de Ville, and the carriage passed under the arcade, he believed it was over with him. He wished to confess to the officer, and upon his refusal uttered such pitiable cries that the officer told him that if he continued to deafen him thus, he should put a gag in his mouth. This measure somewhat reassured Bonacio. If they meant to execute him at La Greve, it could scarcely be worth while to gag him, as they had nearly reached the place of execution. Indeed, the carriage crossed the fatal spot without stopping. There remained, then, no other place to fear but the traitor's cross. The carriage was taking the direct road to it. This time there was no longer any doubt. It was at the traitor's cross that lesser criminals were executed. Panacio had flattered himself in believing himself worthy of St. Paul, or of the Place de Greve. It was the, the traitor's cross that his journey and his destiny were about to end. He could not yet see that dreadful cross, but he felt somehow as if it were coming to meet him. When he was within twenty paces of it, he heard a noise of people, and the carriage stopped. This was more than poor Bonacio could endure depressed as he was by the successive emotions which he had experienced he uttered a feeble groan which might have been taken for the last sigh of a dying man and fainted end of chapter chapter 14 the man of myung the crowd was caused not by the expectation of a man to be hanged but by the contemplation of a man who was hanged. The carriage, which had been stopped for a minute, resumed its way, passed through the crowd, threaded the Rue Saint-Honoré, turned into the Rue des Bons Enfants, and stopped before a low door. The door opened. Two guards received Bonacio and their arms from the officer who supported him. They carried him through an alley, up a flight of stairs and deposited him in an antechamber. All these movements had been effected mechanically, as far as he was concerned. He had walked as one walks in a dream. He had a glimpse of objects as through a fog. His ears had perceived sounds without comprehending them. He might have been executed at that moment without his making a single gesture in his own defense, or uttering a cry to implore mercy. He remained on the bench, with his back leaning against the wall and his hands hanging down, exactly on the spot where the guards placed him. On looking around him, however, as he could perceive no threatening object, as nothing indicated that he ran any real danger, as the bench was 
comfortably covered with a well-stuffed cushion. As the wall was ornamented with a beautiful Cordova leather, and as large red damask curtains, fastened back by gold clasps, floated before the window, he perceived by degrees that his fear was exaggerated, and he began to turn his head to the right and to the left, upward and downward. At this movement, which nobody opposed, he resumed a little courage, and ventured to draw up one leg and then the other. At length, with the help of his two hands, he lifted himself from the bench and found himself on his feet. At this moment, an officer with a pleasant face opened a door, continued to exchange some words with a person in the next chamber, and then came up to the prisoner. "'Is your name Bonacio?' said he. "'Yes, monsieur, officer,' stammered the mercer, more dead than alive. "'At your service.' "'Come in,' said the officer. And he moved out of the way to let the mercer pass. The latter obeyed without reply, and entered the chamber, where he appeared to be expected. It was a large cabinet, close and stifling, with the walls furnished with arms offensive and defensive, and in which there was already a fire, although it was scarcely the end of the month of September. A square table, covered with books and papers, upon which was unrolled an immense plan of the city of La Rochelle, occupied the centre of the room. Standing before the chimney was a man of middle height, of a haughty, proud mien, with piercing eyes, a large brow, and a thin face, which was made still longer by a royal, or an imperial, as it is now called, surmounted by a pair of moustaches. Although this man was scarcely thirty-six or thirty-seven years of age, hair, moustaches, and royal all began to be grey. This man, except a sword, had all the appearances of a soldier, and his buff boots, still slightly covered with dust, indicated that he had been on horseback in the course of the day. This man was Armand Jean Duplessis, Cardinal de Richelieu, not such as he is now represented. Broken down like an old man, suffering like a martyr, his body bent, his voice failing, buried in a large armchair as in an anticipated tomb, no longer living but by the strength of his genius, and no longer maintaining the struggle with Europe but by the eternal application of his thoughts. But such as he really was at this period, that is to say, an active and gallant cavalier, already weak of body, but sustained by that moral power which made of him one of the most extraordinary men that ever lived preparing, after having supported the Duc de Nevers in his Duchy of Mantua, after having taken Nîmes, Castres, and Ouse, to drive the English from the Isle of Ré and lay siege to La Rochelle. At first sight nothing denoted the cardinal, and it was impossible for those who did not know his face to guess in whose presence they were. The poor mercer remained standing at the door, while the eyes of the personage we have just described were fixed upon him, and appeared to wish to penetrate even into the depths of the pass. "'Is this that Bonosio? asked he, after a moment of silence. "'Yes, Monseigneur,' replied the officer. "'That's well. Give me those papers and leave us.' The officer took from the table the papers pointed out, gave them to him who asked for them bowed to the ground, and retired. Bonacio recognized in those papers his interrogatories of the Bastille. From time to time the man by the chimney raised his eyes from the writings, and plunged them like poniards into the heart of the poor mercer. At the end of ten minutes of reading, and ten seconds of examination, the cardinal was satisfied. "'That head has never conspired,' murmured he. "'But it matters not.' We will see. "'You are accused of high treason,' said the cardinal, slowly. "'So I have been told already, Monseigneur,' cried Bonacio, giving his interrogator the title he had heard the officer give him. "'But I swear to you, I know nothing about it.' The cardinal repressed a smile. "'You have conspired with your wife, with Madame de Chevreuse, and with my lord Duke of Buckingham.' "'Indeed, Monseigneur,' responded the mercer. I have heard her pronounce all those names. And on what occasion? 
She said that the Cardinal de Richelieu had drawn the Duke of Buckingham to Paris to ruin him and to ruin the Queen. She said that, cried the Cardinal with violence. Yes, Monseigneur, but I told her she was wrong to talk about such things, and that his eminence was incapable. Hold your tongue, you are stupid, replied the Cardinal. That's exactly what my wife said, Monseigneur. Do you know who carried off your wife? No, Monseigneur. You have suspicions, nevertheless? Yes, Monseigneur. But these suspicions appear to be disagreeable to Monsieur de Commissary, and I no longer have them. Your wife escaped. Did you know that? No, Monseigneur. I learned it since I have been in prison, and that from the conversation of Monsieur de Commissary, an amiable man. The Cardinal repressed another smile. Then you are ignorant of what has become of your wife since your flight. Absolutely, Monseigneur. But she has most likely returned to the Louvre. At one o'clock this morning she had not returned. My God! What can have become of her, then? We shall know, be assured. Nothing is concealed from the Cardinal. The Cardinal knows everything. In that case, Monseigneur, do you believe the Cardinal will be so kind as to tell me what has become of my wife? Perhaps he may. But you must, in the first place, reveal to the Cardinal all you know of your wife's relations with Madame de Chevreuse. But, Monseigneur, I know nothing about them. I have never seen her. When you went to fetch your wife from the Louvre, did you always return directly home? Scarcely ever. She had business to transact with linen drapers, to whose houses I conducted her. And how many were there of these linen drapers? Two, Monseigneur. And where did they live? One in Rue de Vaugirard, and the other Rue de la Harpe. Did you go into these houses with her? Never, Monseigneur. I waited at the door. And what excuse did she give you for entering all alone? She gave me none. She told me to wait, and I waited. You are a very complacent husband, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, said the Cardinal. He calls me his dear Monsieur, said the mercer to himself. Pest! Matters are going all right. Should you know those doors again? Yes. Do you know the numbers? Yes. What are they? Number 25 in Rue de Vaugirard, 75 in Rue de la Harpe. That's well, said the cardinal. At these words he took up a silver bell and rang it. The officer entered. Go, said he, in a subdued voice, and find Rochefort. Tell him to come to me immediately, if he has returned. The Count is here, said the officer, and request to speak with your eminence instantly. Let him come in, then, said the cardinal quickly. The officer sprang out of the apartment with that alacrity which all the servants of the cardinal displayed in obeying him. "'To your eminence!' murmured Bonacio, rolling his eyes round in astonishment. Five seconds had scarcely elapsed since after the disappearance of the officer, when the door opened and a new personage entered. "'It is he!' cried Bonacio. "'He? What he?' asked the cardinal. "'The man who abducted my wife!' The cardinal rang a second time. The officer reappeared. Place this man in the care of his guards again, and let him wait till I send for him. No, Monseigneur, no, it is not he, cried Bonacio. No, I, I was deceived. This is quite another man, and does not resemble him at all. Monsieur is, I am sure, an honest man. Take away that fool, said the cardinal. The officer took Bonacio by the arms and led him into the antechamber where he found his two guards. The newly introduced personage followed Bonacio impatiently with his eyes till he had gone out, and the moment the door closed, "'They have seen each other,' said he, approaching the cardinal eagerly. "'Who?' asked his eminence. "'He and she.' "'The queen and the duke?' cried Richelieu. "'Yes.' "'Where?' "'At the Louvre.' "'Are you sure of it?' "'Perfectly sure.' Who told you of it? Madame de Lannoy, who is devoted to your eminence, as you know. Why did she not let me know sooner? Whether by chance or mistrust, the queen made Madame de Sergy sleep in her chamber, 
and detained her all day. Well, oh, we are beaten. Now let us try to take our revenge. I will assist you with all my heart, Monseigneur. Be assured of that. How did it come about? At half-past twelve the Queen was with her women. Where? In her bedchamber. Go on. When someone came and brought her a handkerchief from her laundress. And then? The Queen immediately exhibited strong emotion, and despite the rouge with which her face was covered, evidently turned pale. And then, and then, she then arose, and with altered voice, Ladies, said she, wait for me ten minutes, I shall soon return. Then she opened the door of her alcove and went out. Why did not Madame de Lannoy come and inform you instantly? Nothing was certain. Besides, Her Majesty had said, Ladies, wait for me, and she did not dare to disobey the Queen. How long did the Queen remain out of the chamber? Three quarters of an hour. None of her women accompanied her? Only Donna Estefania. Did she afterward return? Yes, but only to take a little rosewood casket, with her cipher upon it, and went out again immediately. And when she finally returned, did she bring that casket with her? No. Does Madame de Lannoy know what was in that casket? Yes, the diamond studs which His Majesty gave the Queen. And she came back without this casket? Yes. Madame de Lannoy, then, is of opinion that she gave them to Buckingham? She is sure of it. How can she be so? In the course of the day, Madame de Lannoy, in her quality of tirewoman of the Queen, looked for this casket, appeared uneasy at not finding it, and at length asked information of the Queen. And then the Queen? The Queen became exceedingly red, and replied that having in the evening broken one of those studs, she had sent it to her goldsmith to be repaired. He must be called upon, and so ascertain if the thing be true or not. I have just been with him. And the goldsmith? The goldsmith has heard nothing of it. Well, well, Rochefort, all is not lost, and perhaps, perhaps everything is for the best. The fact is that I do not doubt your eminence's genius. We'll repair the blunders of his agent, is that it? That is exactly what I was going to say, if your eminence had let me finish my sentence. Meanwhile, do you know where the Duchesse de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham are now concealed? No, Monseigneur, my people could tell me nothing on that head. But I know. You, Monseigneur? Yes, or at least I guess. They were, one in the Rue de Vaugirard, number 25, the other in the Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Does your eminence command that they both be instantly arrested? It will be too late. They will be both gone. But still, we can make sure that they are so. Take ten men of my guardsmen, and search the two houses thoroughly. Instantly, Monseigneur. And Rochefort went hastily out of the apartment. The cardinal, being left alone, reflected for an instant, and then rang the bell a third time. The same officer appeared. Bring the prisoner in again, said the cardinal. Monsieur Bonacieux was introduced afresh, and upon a sign from the cardinal, the officer retired. You have deceived me, said the cardinal sternly. I, cried Bonacieux, I deceive your eminence. Your wife, in going to Rue de Vaugirard and Rue de la Harpe, did not go to find linen drapers. Then why did she go, just God? She went to meet the Duchesse de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham. Yes, cried Bonacieux, recalling all his remembrances of the circumstances. Yes, that's it. Your eminence is right. I told my wife several times that it was surprising that linen drapers should live in such houses as those, in houses that had no signs, but she always laughed at me. Ah, Monseigneur, continued Bonacieux throwing himself at his eminence's feet. 
Ah, how truly you are the cardinal, the great cardinal, the man of genius whom all the world reveres! The cardinal, however contemptible might be the triumph gained over so vulgar a being as Bonacieux, did not the less enjoy it for an instant. Then, almost immediately, as if a fresh thought had occurred, a smile played upon his lips, and he said, offering his hand to the mercer, Rise, my friend, you are a worthy man. The cardinal has touched me with his hand. I have touched the hand of the great man, cried Bonacieux. The great man has called me his friend. Yes, my friend, yes, said the cardinal, with that paternal tone which he sometimes knew how to assume, but which deceived none who knew him. And as you have been unjustly suspected, well, you must be indemnified. Here, take this purse of a hundred pistoles, and pardon me. I pardon you, Monseigneur, cried Bonacieux, hesitating to take the purse, fearing, doubtless, that this pretended gift was but a pleasantry. But you are able to have me arrested. You are able to have me tortured. You are able to have me hanged. You are the master, and I could not have the least word to say. Pardon you, Monseigneur, you cannot mean that. Ah, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, you are generous in this matter. I see it, and I thank you for it. Thus, then, you will take this bag, and you will go away without being too malcontent. I go away enchanted. Farewell, then, or rather, au revoir. And the cardinal made him a sign with his hand, to which Bonacio replied by bowing to the ground. He then went out backward, and when he was in the antechamber, the cardinal heard him, in his enthusiasm, crying aloud, Long life to the Monseigneur! Long life to his eminence! Long life to the great Cardinal! The Cardinal listened with a smile to this vociferous manifestation of the feelings of Monsieur Bonacieux, and then, when Bonacieux's cries were no longer audible, Good, said he, that man will henceforward lay down his life for me. And the Cardinal began to examine with the greatest attention the map of La Rochelle, which, as we have said, lay open on the desk, tracing with a pencil the line in which the famous dyke was to pass, which, eighteen months later, shut up the port of the besieged city. As he was in the deepest of his strategic meditations, the door opened, and Rochefort returned. Well, said the cardinal, eagerly, rising with a promptitude which proved the degree of importance he attached to the commission with which he had charged the count. Well, said the latter, a young woman of about twenty-six or twenty-eight years of age, and a man of from thirty-five to forty, have indeed lodged at the two houses pointed out by your eminence. But the woman left last night, and the man this morning. It was they! cried the cardinal, looking at the clock. It is now too late to have them pursued. Mm. The Duchesse is at Tours, and the Duke at Boulogne. It is in London they must be found. What are your eminence's orders? Not a word of what is past. Let the queen remain in perfect security. Let her be ignorant that we know her secret. Let her believe that we are in search of some conspiracy or other. Send me the keeper of the seals, Seguier. And that man, what has your eminence done with him? What man? asked the cardinal. That Bonacio. I have done with him all that could be done. I have made him a spy upon his wife. The Comte de Rochefort bowed like a man who acknowledges the superiority of the master as great, and retired. Left alone, the cardinal seated himself again and wrote a letter, which he secured with his special seal. Then he rang. The officer entered for the fourth time. Tell Vitre to come to me, said he and tell him to get ready for a journey. An instant after, the man he asked for was before him, booted and spurred. Vitre, said he, you will go with all speed to London. You must not stop an instant on the way. You will deliver this letter to Milady. Here is an order for two hundred pistoles. Call upon my treasure and get the money. You shall have as much again if you are back within six days and have executed your commission well. 
The messenger, without replying a single word, bowed, took the letter, with the order for the two hundred pistoles, and retired. Here is what the letter contained. Milady, be it the first ball at which the Duke of Buckingham shall be present. He will wear on his doublet twelve diamond studs. Get as near to him as you can, and cut off two. As soon as these studs shall be in your possession, inform me. End of chapter.